Cavalcade of Sports is on the air. From Wrigley Field in Chicago, Gillette presents the World Series. Men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. Good afternoon, baseball fans everywhere. This is Bill Slater with Al Helfer and Bill Thorum greeting you for the Gillette Safety Razor Company as the Chicago Cubs and Detroit Tigers get ready for the deciding seventh game in this thrilling 1945 championship series. Gillette is on the air the year round with on-the-spot reports of leading sports events, including the Kentucky Derby, football, ball games, and similar classics. Gillette also broadcasts the major boxing match of the week regularly every Friday night. And now this afternoon in Chicago, on the shores of Lake Michigan, we await breathlessly the start of this seventh and deciding game of the 1945 series. A series that has been at the same time one of the zaniest, most thrilling, and record-smashing series in a long, long while. Records have been broken in total number of players involved, total number of pinch hitters involved, records smashed in total income, records smashed in the longest game in the point of time ever played, that 12-inning struggle on Monday. And only 36,185 are needed to come into the stands this afternoon to top the all-time attendance record, set back in 1926 between the Yanks and the Cards. And three pitchers have appeared in this series, who the first time out were practically invincible but could not come through the second time. Virgil Truck, Claude Passeau, Dizzy Trout. And then there's been one pitcher who was no good the first time and came back to win the second time, and that's Hal Newhauser, and he's going to try to repeat today. And then there's been Fordham Hank Baroy, who the first time out, yes, the second time, no. And Monday, he came through for his second victory, and Baroy will be trying to place himself in the immortal halls of baseball by striving for his third victory as he pitches for the Cubs this afternoon. This has been the greatest radio hookup in the history of sports radio, with the broadcast going to Rome to Berlin, to Tokyo, and all around the world, wherever the far-flung outposts of American military might exist today. And each team in this series has been better in the other's park than it has been at home. And one-eyed Conley, the world's champion gate crasher, hired on as an usher, has tried to keep the owner of the park, Phil Wrigley, from coming into his own park. We've had some of the coldest weather in any of the series, and yet at the same time, some of the most pleasant. And we've had Stanley Hack in that thrilling game on Monday, almost the goat with his two hours, and then coming through with four hits out of five to be the hero of the struggle, to drive in the winning run for Chicago on the last of the 12th with two out. And we've had the spectacle of an error being charged against Hank Greenberg in left field, and then later in the evening, along about midnight, retracted by the official scores. So in this particular series, one of the most thrilling of all time, and the first seven-game series since the Tigers battled the Cincinnati Reds in 1940, we have had absolutely everything, and this afternoon is going to be the climax. And now to give you his own inimitable view of what's coming up this afternoon is the great sports columnist and our friend Bill Carm. Looking very sharp today, Bill. Thank you, Bill. And we're right back where we started in Detroit last Wednesday as far as this series goes. Except, of course, that whatever may happen today saving the remote possibility of a tie game called Because of Darkness, this is payday. Steve O'Neill and Charlie Grimm led with their aces in that first game in Briggs Stadium and are going to lead with them again in this seventh and deciding game. Al Neuhauser for the battening Bengals and Hank Baroy for the clawing little bear. Which gives Baroy a chance to tie another World Series record, by the way. If the tall Jersey right-hander should win this afternoon... He will become the second pitcher ever to win three games and lose one in the same series. I think that's true. I wouldn't want to bet all the tea in China on it, even if I had all the tea in China. But I believe that grand pitcher of the Chicago White Sox of many seasons back, Old Urban the Red Faber, won three games in the 1917 World Series and lost one. Of course, Matheson, Jack Holmes, the only pitcher beside Baroy ever to win for both leagues, Stan Kovaleski, Babe Adams, and Faber all have won three games in one series. But none except Faber ever won three and also lost one. And that will be Baroy's record if he can come through this afternoon. If New Oz's arm was in good shape, you'd have to give him a distinct edge over Baroy and most any other flinger around today as well. But we all know that, unfortunately, Bonnie Prince Hal's arm is not in the best possible shape. Indeed, he's expected to have it operated on, on during the off-season. It's that bad, or so we understand. On the other hand, Neuhauser has had one day more rest than Baroy. So the best guess is that like the previous games and the series itself, this decisive one will be a toss-up where anything can happen. And it isn't as if practically everything hasn't already happened. We've had about everything except a triple play, a balk, and a wedding at home plate. 
I was happy to see the official scorers change their ruling on Hack's hit, that one Monday's 12-inning thriller. If you happen to be listening then, you know how disconcerted and confused I got trying to get the totals of the game straight in my post-game summary. That was partly because I couldn't find on my card where Detroit had more than one error. It turned out that on Hack's hit, the first ruling by the official scores, Martin Haley, Ed Burns, Henry Salsinger, and Fred Lieb, four of the most competent baseball men around and all eminently fair gentlemen, had been that it was a single for Stan and an error for Hank Greenberg. But it couldn't have been an error for Lank Hack, really. The ball bounced completely and cleanly over his head. The ruling would have made him something of a goat for Detroit, which he definitely didn't deserve to be. On the contrary, he has been one of old Tag's staunchest heroes, if not the staunchest. It happened that sitting here in the radio booth well down the third baseline, Bill Slater, who called the play on Hack's hit, and I were both in the perfect position to watch the ball. And it took practically a perpendicular hop just before it reached Greenberg's hands, which were extended toward it on the ground. By the way, we're so far down the third baseline that we're almost past the big screen back of home plate, which incidentally isn't a screen at all, but a Grand Banks fishing net sent, if my memory serves me, to the elder Wrigley by some friend for his new and beautiful park here. Anyhow, Slater says that it is a very sane thing to have here, but remember he said it and I didn't. Now, Baroy's record, if it materializes, is not the only one that will be tied, set, and broken in this game. All sorts of new records will fall. But you've heard most of that from Slater's already. The main thing is the game itself. I hope it will be just half as exciting and pulse-pounding as Monday's sensational battle royal. And that the better team will win it, and the series too, of course. It's been a wonderful series, even if it hasn't produced the best baseball ever seen by a mighty long shot. The fans have loved it as they should, and it's been a real pleasure and privilege for us to bring it to you listeners the best we could particularly to our boys over and on the seas, in the Pacific, Japan, Europe, on their ships, and everywhere they are. Which reminds me, Harry Roberts, baseball writer for the Chicago Daily News and a lieutenant in the Navy, brother helper, flew in from San Francisco this morning to see the final game and root for the Cubs. He just landed from the carrier Ticonderoga straight from Tokyo, and he heard the broadcast of the other games at sea by shortwave. And that's that for now, fans. But I'll be back to give you a quick summary of the highlights when the game ends. Fans, there's little doubt that Americans want a hard peace for those guilty of starting the war. But none of us wants a hard peace for the millions of destitute men, women, and children in allied countries freed from Axis enslavement. Yet without our help, cruel and bitter times lie ahead for the folks who are still fighting famine, pestilence, and cold. One of the chief hopes for their salvation lies in the National War Fund, a federation of 19 major relief and welfare agencies. These agencies are over there, distributing blankets to people who have shivered for years, cod liver oil for undernourished children, seeds to replant farms, medicine to fight plagues, and they are doing many other life-saving tasks. So when you're asked to donate to the Community War Fund, dig down deep, please. Be generous in victory. Now, here are the Detroit and Chicago batting orders as we come up to just a few moments before the start of this thrilling seventh and final game of this Fight 45 series. For Detroit, here is the batting order. The leadoff hitter, as usual, will be the shortstop, Jimmy Webb. Batting number two will be the second baseman, Eddie Mayo. Batting third will be the center fielder, Roger Kramer, C-R-A-M-E-R. Batting fourth will be big captain Hank Greenberg, the left fielder. Batting fifth will be Roy Cullenbein, the right fielder. Batting number six will be Rudolph York, the first baseman. Batting number seven, Jimmy Outlaw, the third baseman. Batting number eight, Paul Richards, the veteran catcher. And batting ninth, young Prince Hal Newhauser, the talented lefty who is a Detroit boy all the way. So there is the batting order for the Detroit Tigers. For the home standing and embattled Chicago Cubs, they will bat in this order. The leadoff hitter will be Stanley Hack, the third baseman, who is the hitting star of the series up to this point. Batting number two for Chicago, Second baseman, Don Johnson. Batting third, left fielder, Harry Lowry, L-O-W-R-E-Y. Batting fourth, the star first baseman, Phil Cavaretta, Chicago boy all the way. Batting number five, center fielder, Handy Andy Pafko, P-A-F-K-O. Batting sixth, the big right fielder, Bill Nicholson, N-I-C-H-O-L-S-O-N. Batting number seven, the redoubtable catcher, Mickey Livingston. Batting number eight, the veteran shortstop, Roy Hughes, 
and batting number ninth and trying for the Iron Man stunt. In the 1945 series, Fordham Hank Baroy, the New Jerseyite who is just now completing his warm-up pitches down in front of the Cub dugout down the third base line. Here are the umpires, Art Passarella of the American League at the plate, Jocko Conlon of the National League at first, Billy Summers of the American League at second, and Lou Jordan of the National League at third. Now that's the way the scene is set at this particular moment, and while we're waiting for the umpires to come to home plate to confer with the rival managers, Jolly Charlie Grimm and Stout Steve O'Neill, uh, we're going to pause 10 seconds here for station identification. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago, serving the Middle West. In the huddle between representatives of the two clubs and the umpires, now going on down at home plate, which is, of course, always the part of the last moments before a game begins, Phil Cavaretta, the playing captain of the Chicago Cubs, is representing Chicago, and Steve O'Neill, representing the Detroit Tigers. Now the umpires are fanning out. Incidentally, the alternate umpires here are Charlie Berry of the American League and Lee Ballenfant of the National League. They just dress and sit in the dugouts every day, and it's a very sweet job. Steve O'Neill is moving down to third base now, where he's going to coach, and the Chicago team is coming on the field. Art Mills will coach it first for the Detroit Tigers. And now, with the Cubs out on the field, in their proper defensive order, the whole crowd, and it's a throng, rises to its feet. Heads are bared. Hands snap up a right hand salute on the part of the military personnel here. And Armin Hans Van plays the national anthem. And now is the most glorious flag that ever rode the breeze flies high from the flagstaff in deep center field with bank flags of the United Station United Nations on its right and on its left. Everything is all set for the start of this seventh and deciding game of this great 45 series. And all set, looking very sharp and feeling very sharp, is our colleague on these broadcasts who will bring you the first four and a half innings of play, big handsome Al Halfa. Well, thanks, Bill. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Rather uh, chilly here in Chicago, as Bill has already told you this afternoon. But uh, nevertheless, we're expecting a humdinger of a ball game. Uh, this seventh consecutive World Series that Gillette has brought you, it goes down to the seventh and final game of the entire series. And uh, I think that Ed uh, Wilhelm, who is sitting over here to our left, is probably just as anxious as everyone else here in the stands and in the radio booth to see this ball game get underway. Also very anxious this afternoon is Hank Baroy. I talked to the Fordham Ghost just before the ball game started, and... He wants this one. And actually, so does Hal Newhauser. We spoke briefly with him, too, just before we came up from the playing field up to the radio booth. And these two pitchers will be out there, and as the boys in the trade say, they'll be bowing their neck this afternoon to try to get this final win to put their team up on top. The umpires, as given you by Bill Slater, are correct. Passarelli at the plate, Conlon at first, Summers at second, and Jordan at third. The lineups, as given you by Bill, are intact also. And we should like to pass this on at the start of this ball game that the Chicago Cubs, as far as batting is concerned, are out hitting the Detroit Tigers with a team percentage, as they field right now, of 288, while the Detroit Tigers have a percentage of 202. And Skeeter Webb, who is hitting at 174, the Detroit shortstop is standing in right now, hitting right-handed. Roy pitches him, and it's taken on the inside for ball one. So this ball game, the seventh and final game in the 1945 World Series, has now gotten underway here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. 
Roy throws again, and there's a high curve on the outside for ball two. So Hank has gotten behind now to the Detroit shortstop. Two balls, no strikes. The outfield playing straight away, and not very deep on Skeeter Webb. Roy throws another curve in there that's good for a strike. And now it's two and one. Webb has had four hits in 23 at-bats here in the World Series of 1945. He takes the next pitch, and it's right through the middle for a foul strike, and that's two and two. Two balls, two strikes. The first hitter up for Detroit here in the very top half of the first inning. Roy kicks, twists, throws a high curve, and almost got away from Livingston. That's ball three to Skeeter Webb. Three and two. Hank Broy on the mound for Chicago. His battery mate is Mickey Livingston. Broy throws three and two. Webb swings on it. There's a clean base hit through the hole between first and second and into right field. Skeeter Webb opens the top of the first inning with a single to right field. And that, incidentally, in the series is hit number 19 off Broy. Hit number one off him this afternoon. The batter now hitting at 217 is second baseman Eddie Mayo of Detroit. He hits left-handed. And he's opening his stance more of late. He pulls that right foot down toward first base. Sort of guards the plate slightly from behind. Roy checks his runner at first, throws to the plate, and Mayo swings on it. And there's another clean base hit right through the hole into right field. Skeeter Webb is coming off second base. There's Nicholson's throw into third, but it's not nearly in time. With the hit and run on, Webb moves into third base as Mayo singles behind him into right field. That's hit number two off for Roy. And that's the 20th base hit he's given up here in the 1945 World Series. And Paul Derringer starts hurriedly to get ready down in the Chicago bullpen. So big Paul Derringer is starting to throw very rapidly. Runners at first and third for Detroit. No outs. And here is Doc Kramer, who is tied for the number four spot in hitting honors. Of all the ball players playing in the series. He's hitting at 333, as is Captain Hank Greenberg. But Kramer, hitting left-handed, is up there now. There's a quick throw to first base just to keep Mayo close. Cabaretta returns that ball to the mound. Now Broy is ready. Checks the plate. Throws to the plate. There's a low curve on the outside, Doc Kramer, for ball one. One ball, no strikes. This is the top of the first inning, and the Detroit Tigers are threatening. Roy checks the runner at first, now at third, then throws a high curve in there that's looped out into short left field. It may fall in for a base hit. It does fall in. Here comes Webb in from third, easily to score. And it's one to nothing, Detroit. Peter Webb was on at third base. Doc Kramer hit an outside pitch and blooped it out behind third into left field. And Hughes, the shortstop, went back, and he couldn't get it. So the first run comes in, and that's hit number three off for Roy, and I think that's going to be all for Hank. The score is one to nothing in favor of Detroit, and that is the sixth run Hank for Roy has given up in the 1945 World Series, and it's definitely an earned run. All six runs he has given up have been earned. And I believe Paul Derringer is going to be called upon right here in the top half of the first inning. Yes, here comes Paul Derringer. So Broy can't get anybody out in the top half of the first inning. This is quite a spot for the veteran Paul Derringer to be coming into. He'll pitch first of all to Hank Greenberg. That's a pretty tough customer. So Paul Derringer is being called upon. Hank Broy apparently did not have his stuff this afternoon against Detroit. But Derringer has come on. As far as Derringer is concerned, he's uh, done a little pitching before in this series also. He's pitched uh, three and two-third innings. There's a round of applause for Hank Barroy. As far as World Series appearance prior to this year, Paul Derringer has won two and lost four. Derringer pitched, if you recall, for St. Louis, the Cardinals, also for the Cincinnati Reds in the National League. He pitched in the 31 series, he pitched in the 39 series, and his last series was in 1940. He was with Cincinnati then and pitched against these self-same Detroit Tigers. And his series record up until now is two wins and four defeats. Ball's a grand veteran of the game. Kentucky born and bred, and he's out there right now. 
pitch for Chicago. Your pitches we said first of all to Hank Greenberg. Now here's the position in the top of the first inning. One run has been scored by Detroit. We'll uh, review it for you. Webb singled through the hole between first and second and out into right field on a 3-2 pitch. Eddie Mayo came up then and with the hit and run flash, Skeeter Webb was on his way for second. And Eddie Mayo, a left-handed hitter, drilled the ball nicely between first and second and into right to put Webb on at third. Then Doc Kramer came up and hit a fast outside pitch and broke it into left field for a base hit. And that put Mayo on second and scored Webb from third. So there are no outs here in the top of the first inning. The Tigers lead one to nothing, and Greenberg is up at bat. He's had seven hits in 21 tries here in this World Series. And he's hitting at 333. Ball, right-hand hitter, stands just off the plate. Now Derringer is ready. He'll make his first pitch here in the first inning. Throws, and there's a bunt pushed down to first base. Phil Cabaretta picks it up, steps over on the first base line, and tags Greenberg out unassisted as the runners move on. So Greenberg, despite the fact he's a terrific slugger, was sent up by Steve O'Neill to sacrifice the boys along, and he successfully did so. Phil Cabaretta taking care of the foot out at first base. So Kramer on the sacrifice moves over to second base, and Eddie Mayo moves down to third. Now here's Roy Cullenbine, who is hitting at 250. And they're going to intentionally walk Cullenbine. Despite the fact that he's only had five hits and 20 times up, Cullenbine can be a pretty tough customer. So Charlie Grimm has ordered Derringer to put him on. There's the second ball pitched way wide. There's the third one. And now pitch out number four. That's the sixth time that Roy Cullenbine has drawn a base on balls here in this World Series. That is the first base on balls issued this afternoon. It's given up by Derringer. Now with the bases loaded, Cullenbine at first, Kramer at second, Mayo at third, and one out. The batter up there is Rudy York. It's a one to nothing ball game in favor of the Detroit Tigers, and it's tooth and nail here this afternoon, and it will be for the entire length of this ball game. Derringer winds up slowly, delivers, a uh, change of pace curve, it's in for a strike. That was a three-quarter overhand curveball. The change of pace variety, and big Rudy York took it. Eddie Mayo leads down off third, Kramer steps off second, and Kellen Bay moves off first. Derringer pitches, York takes, and it's a low curve under his knees for ball one. One ball, one strike is the count on Rudy York. He's hitting a 2 8 for his work in the series. He's had five hits for 24 official at-bats. We've got a lot of activity down in the Chicago both end. Now Derringer pitches. York takes and there's a fast one in for a strike. Big umpaw just reared back and fogged it in. He looked like to Derringer of old that time. He doesn't throw that high hard one so much anymore. But when he cuts it loose, it's still got plenty of that stuff on it. Down in the bullpen, Claude Passo and High Vandenberg are both getting ready for Chicago. Now here comes the next one and two delivery. York takes it. It's a high curve to level off the count at two and two. Two balls, two strikes. The bases are jammed here with Tigers in the top of the first inning. Only one out. Detroit has once scored, and they lead one to nothing. Baroy is out of there now, and Paul Derringer is trying to put out this Detroit fire. Derringer kicks high. The big six-footer throws, and there's a low sweeping curve on the outside for ball three. Derringer stands 6'4 and weighs 230 pounds. 39-year-old veteran, and he has plenty of pressure on his shoulders right now. But he's been in spots like this before. Here's a 3-2 and two pitch to Rudy York. It's a fast curve. It's hit out to right field. It may fall in for a base hit. Nicholson goes over near the line, and it just falls foul. It just falls foul by inches out back of right field. Rudy York almost hit one, but it just veered off and went foul by inches way deep in the corner. So that means that Rudy York is going to have to come back and do it all over again. Paul Derringer is going to have to throw another 3-2 pitch to a very dangerous hitter. That's a tense situation here in the top half of the first inning. Hit. Seventh game of the World Series here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. And now the sun is coming out. It's getting a little more brilliant down on the diamond. Still very cool. Quite a bit of wind blowing from behind home out towards center field. Here's the 3-2 pitch. York swings and fouls it off. The count stays at 3-2. and two. In case you just tuned in or just hooked up with us, 
The score is one to nothing, Detroit. One out, the base is loaded, Rudy York at bat with the count of three and two, and Derringer has relieved Baroy. He pitches now, and York swings, and there's a high foul up to the right of the plate. Mickey Livingston scoots back, but he can't get it. It's way back into the stands. So the count stays at three and two on Rudy York. Chicago infield playing their normal fielding depth. Of course, they're hoping that Derringer will get the Rudy York to hit onto the ground. And that's just the thing that the Tigers do not want to see happen. The outfield is playing very deep to Rudy York. They have a right to do so because he clouts a long ball. He gave evidence of that down at Briggs Stadium in Detroit. He's probably hit the longest ball in this entire series. He hit that ball well over 400 feet and it was caught. Down in the bullpen for the Chicago Cubs. Still throwing very hard. Claude Passo and High Vandenberg. Just in case Derringer has any trouble here in trying to get Detroit out at the top of the first inning. We'll go over the situation for you. At third base is Eddie Mayo. At second base is Doc Kramer. And at first base, purposely walked, is Roy Cullenbein. So the bases are jammed. Score one to nothing, Tigers. And Derringer's ready to throw 3-2 to Rudy York. Down it rides. York swings on. There's a high infield pop-up. Down at shortstop is Stanley Hack floating in front of Hughes. And he takes it for the out. Well, that's the second out now for Detroit in the top half of the first inning. And Paul Derringer came down behind the plate to back up that play just in case. And he picked up Mickey Livingston's mask and handed it to Mickey and patted him on the back as if to say, you helped me get him out of that one. Well, that was the all-important out as far as Derringer was concerned. Still, he's not out of the woods by a long shot. The bases are still loaded here with Tigers in the top of the first inning. And Jimmy Outlaw, who is hitting at 167, is standing in. Outlaw, a right-handed choke hitter, stands deep at the plate, and the little fellow sort of crouches over slightly from the waist. Derringer pitches him, and Outlaw takes, and there's a little curve at his knees for ball one. Mayo takes his lead off third. It's a generous lead. Derringer's paying him no mind. He's busily engaged pitching to Outlaw, the Detroit third baseman. Outlaw's had four hits and 24 at-bats in this series. Derringer pitches him, and there's a curve ball. It slides off on the inside for ball two. The outfield has stepped up a couple of steps to Outlaw. He doesn't hit a particularly long ball. He's more of a punch hitter. Al Derringer, big six-foot-four-inch right-hander, delivers, and there's a high curve right off the point of the chin of Outlaw for ball three. Three balls, no strikes. Derringer visits at Rosenbag. As far as he's concerned, there's an awful lot riding with every pitch he makes. Down comes the next one. Outlaw takes it, and it's on the inside for ball four, and that forces in Mayo from third. That's the second walk given up by Derringer, but he lost this man. He walked Cullen by him purposely. However, that run is charged against Baroy. So it's a two-to-nothing ball game now in favor of the Detroit Tigers. Paul Richards comes wandering up to the plate to do a little hitting for Detroit. He's the eighth man to come up here in the top half of the first inning. Cullen Bond moves over to second, and Kramer takes his station at third as Outlaw. Goes down on the walk and takes his position at first. The bases are still loaded, still two outs. Score Detroit two, Chicago nothing. Derringer winds slowly, kicks high, throws, a fast curve that's low under the knees of Richards for ball one. This tall Texan stands almost straight up and down at the plate and hits him right-handed. Stands deep just as far back as he possibly can. He's hitting at 133, 2 for 15. He swings on the next pitch and falls down as he foul tips it. The count on Richards now is 1 and 1. One ball, one strike. The outfield fans slightly around the left. And out in left field, Peanuts Lowry is playing deep to Paul Richards. Hughes at shortstop has come down a couple of steps toward the foul line, the left field foul line, and he's playing deep in the hole at shortstop. Derringer throws. There's a fast one swung on and fouled back into the screen for strike two. Well, the count on Richards is one ball, two strikes. There are two outs on Detroit here in the top of the first inning. They lead the Cubs by a margin of two runs as the score stands. Detroit two, Chicago nothing. Derringer in a lot of trouble, not of his own making, but nevertheless he's had to shoulder the burden. He's out there. He throws one and two now and Richards swings. 
There's a fly ball going deep in the left field. It may drop in and it may not. It is in fair territory. Drops in the corner. In comes Kramer to score. Cullenbein is also coming in. Outlaw comes around and he too scores. It's a double. For Richards. Well, three more runs come piling in for Detroit here in the top of the first inning. Detroit has a total now of five. The man at the plate is Hal Newhauser. Being left-handed, and he takes the first pitch high for ball one. Richards leads down off second base. Gerringer pitches, and there's one swung on and missed for a strike. So the count on Newhauser is one and one. Newhauser has just been announced with the count of one and one on him. He swings on the next pitch and hits a foul ball out back of left field and it falls away into the seats. So the count on him now is one ball, two strikes. Paul Richards just hammered in three more runs for the Tigers and they lead five to nothing. Derringer throws. There's a low curve under the knees of Newhauser for ball two. That makes his count two and two. Al hitting left handed. Standing very deep at the plate, sort of guarding it from behind. Four runs have been scored off Baroy and one run off Derringer. Now Paul is ready. Down comes the next pitch, and Newhauser hits one down to second base. Johnson comes up with it at second, throws to Phil Cabaretta, and that's all for Newhauser, going out four to three. Well, we'll count up the damage now in the first inning as nine men came to bat for Detroit. A total of five runs on one. Two, three, four hits. There was one man left, and there were no errors. So at the end of the top of the first inning, Detroit leads in the seventh game of the World Series, five to nothing. And now, men, before this final game of the 1945 World Series goes any further, let me point out that you look better and feel better when you shave the smooth, refreshing all Gillette way. Yes, when you soften your whiskers with Gillette shaving cream, lather or brushless, and whisk them off with today's Gillette Blue Blade and your Gillette Razor, your face looks and feels its very best. You see, Gillette shaving creams are thoroughgoing, fast-acting beard softeners that hold abundant moisture and stay wet on your face. What's more, today's Gillette Blue Blade has the sharpest, smoothest finished edges that ever sailed through a fellow's whiskers. Working together, they give you the swellest shaves of your life. Ask your dealer for Gillette Brushless or Gillette Lather, a quarter, and shave this easier all-Gillette way. Remember, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. Now for the last half of inning number one. It's a five to nothing ball game in favor of the Detroit Tigers as they went out and got themselves five right in the very first frame. They got themselves five runs on four hits. Three hits coming off Roy and one, a damaging double coming off the offering of Derringer. Now Stanley Hack gets a round of applause as he steps up to the plate to be the first Chicago Cub hitter. He's leading all hitters here in the series at 440. He takes the first pitch as Newhauser zips a fast one in there for a strike. Hack hitting left-handed, stands deep at the plate. Newhauser takes his sign from Paul Richards, pumps once. 24-year-old left-hander delivers, and Hack hits a ball down to third, and it's foul just outside of the bag. All the count on Stanley Hack. There's no balls, two strikes. Hacks had 11 hits for 25 at-bats here in this series for a percentage of 440 as he stands at the plate this red-hot second. If he gets another base hit, he's going to be able to tie a record of long standing. We'll tell you about that if and when it happens. He takes the next pitch, and it's a curve in there for a called strike three, and Hack knew it. So the first man Newhauser faces, he strikes out here in the last of the first inning. And that's strikeout number one for Newhouse this afternoon. That's strikeout number 13 for him in his 11 and uh, two-third innings pitched in the World Series. Now Don Johnson hitting at 167. It's right-handed to standing in. He takes a look at the first pitch, and it's a high curve up above the letters of the shirt. That's ball one. One ball, no strikes. 
Neuhauser gets ready. Youngfall throws a fast one in there that's hit out over shortstop and out into left center field. Doc Kramer chases it, picks it up, but Johnson is on his way to second. Here comes the throw. It's not in time, and Johnson slides, and he's safe at second with a double. John Johnson has just gotten his fifth hit on his 25th at bat here in the series. Doubles to left center field. And Peanuts Lowry hitting a 280 is standing up to the plate right now. New to delivers him, and Lowry takes a high curve up above his shoulder. That's ball one. Peanuts Lowry hits right handed and stands deep at the plate. Legs wide spread apart. New throws a fast in there, and Lowry swings and doesn't get it. The one and one count now on the Chicago left fielder, Harry Peanut Lowry. Johnson with his double is on at second base. That is the second extra base blow here in the seventh game of the World Series. Both of them have been hitting the left field. Richards in the first inning for Detroit hit one very nicely down into the left field corner. That double of his scored three runs for Detroit. They lead, you know, right now, five to nothing. Newhouser checks back at second, looks at Johnson, now throws to the plate. Lowry pushes the bat back toward the mound. It's picked up by Newhouser, and he bobbles it for the moment. Picks up, throws, not in time. Well, Hal Newhouser went after Peanuts Lowry's bunt, and by the time he got his hands on it, he bobbled it for the moment. And then too late to first base. So Chicago has runners at first and second. The official score will give us his verdict in a minute. But Al Benton is starting to get ready down in the Tiger bullpen. Now here is Phil Cabaretta hitting left-handed. And an error is being charged against Hal Newhauser. Johnson is on at second and Lowry is on at first. Down it comes. Phil swings on it. It's a base hit to right field. Johnson comes whistling by third, comes on into score, and Lowry slides into third. Phil Cabaretta teed off on one and smacked it right past Eddie Mayo and out into right field for a base hit. And on the blow, Don Johnson came on in from second to score. And Peanuts Lowry running on the blow, moved into third base. So now Chicago has runners at first and third, one out. And the score is five to one in favor of Detroit. And there's a big conference right now down at the mound with Hal Newhauser. Eddie Mayo is in on that conference. And Paul Richards. And he has asked, has Paul Richards, for a new chin protector. The shin guard has been snapped in this last operation. So he's getting a new one. Time has been called for it. And that off Hal Newhauser, we uh, would like to go back and say, is the second hit here in this ball game. It is the 17th hit he's given up in the World Series, and that is the 12th run that has been gotten off Newhauser. The first one this afternoon. It's a 5-1 to one ball game in favor of the Detroit Tigers and the Chicago Cubs are also bearing their claws here in the last half of the first. They're trying desperately to get back into this ball game because it's winner today taking the series. Now, standing up at the plate is Andy Pafko, who is hitting a 208. He takes the first curve, and it's in there for a strike. Just sort of automatically call it a curve when Newhouser delivers because he's got quite an assortment. Pafko is hitting a 208, as we said. He has had five hits. For 24 at for uh, 24 at bats, Pafko swings on the next pitch as the ball hit the short. It's played back to Mayo for one out. The throw on to first two outs. That's the first double play here this afternoon. Andy Pafko hit one down to Skeeter Webb at short. He played it very nicely back to Eddie Mayo for the force out on Cabaretta coming down, and then Mayo whipped it over to first base, and that's all. Well, Chicago scores one time here in the last half of the first inning. One run on two hits. There was a man left, and there was one Detroit error. So at the end of one full inning of play, the score stands 
5-1 to one in favor of the Detroit Tigers as we go into the top half of inning number two right here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. And Paul Derringer comes out of the dugout, moves out to the mound now to start the top of the second inning. But before we get into the top of the second inning, we have just a few moments, seconds as a matter of fact, to pause for station identification. So remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago, serving in the West. Skeeter Webb here at Wrigley Field will start the second batting around for the Detroit Tigers. He's starting off in the top of the second inning. Derringer kicks high and throws, and Webb swings on a fast curve and misses for strike one. Webb got himself a single at right field in the first inning. Derringer pitches left, swings. There's a long fly ball in the center field. Andy Papko goes back, still going back, reaches over his head and takes it for the out. A long fly ball, center field. That guy, Andy Papko, can go get him out in that outer orchard. He went back and took it. The batter coming up to the plate now for Detroit is Eddie Mayo. He's had six hits now for 24 at-bats. Hit nicely behind Skeeter Webb in the first inning to move uh, Jimmy around third. Mayo hitting left-handed. Derringer curves him. It's a medium-speed curve ball. Mayo ran up on it as if to bunt and then took it. All these bat down off his shoulder and it was outside for ball one. Well, some of the crowd here throwing its disapproval. Call it that one. But Mayo didn't attempt to lay that wood on the horse side at all. Derringer comes down with the next pitch. Mayo swings on it, and there's a fly ball to center. Andy Papko backs just one step and takes it for the out. That's all for Mayo. Plotting one into straightaway center field. So very quickly now in the top of the second inning, there are two outs for Detroit. That brings to bat Doc Kramer. Doc hit the first run in here in this ball game with a looping fly ball into left field. They've got Webb in from third. So he's had one hit and one try this afternoon. Doc hitting left-handed. Derringer tries a blooper ball in there that floats in and over. Doc Kramer for a called strike. Derringer's been uh, working on that pitch all year. Pretty well has it mastered. He tries it against a knuckler. He threw this time. And missed with it just outside. It's one and one. One ball, one strike. Derringer doesn't throw that knuckler a great many times. But he's got pretty good control of it. Big Paul winds now. Kicks high. Throws a fastball. It's taken low under the knees. That's ball two. Two balls, one strike. This is the top of the second inning. Detroit, two outs, no base runners, and they lead in this ball game five to one. Derringer pumps, throws. There's a ball laced very solidly out into right field for a base hit for Doc Kramer. For Kramer, singles to right. That's hit number two of Derringer. Hit number five as far as the Detroit Tigers are concerned. And now they have as many hits as they have runs. Well, if five is any significance, the guy coming up to the plate is wearing a big five on the back of his uniform shirt. That's Hank Greenberg. He sacrificed successfully in the first inning, so his pregame batting percentage of 333 for the series remains intact. He's looking for a base hit number eight. Derringer curves him, and there's a fast one through there for a strike. No balls, one strike on Hank Greenberg, hitting right-handed. Hank calls his bat down as if to bunt and takes the pitch. And it's high and on the outside. That levels the count out to Hank at one and one. One ball, one strike. Kramer leads off at first. Cabaretta straddle on the inside corner holds him close. Derringer checks his runner, then throws to the plate, and Greenberg takes a high curve. The ball two. Two balls, one strike. High Vandenberg is still throwing down in the Chicago bullpen. Just in case Derringer is going to have any trouble here in the second inning. Greenberg takes another curve, and Derringer thought he had it in, but it was a little low for ball three. Derringer comes down off the mound and starts to beat to plate umpire Art Passarelli of the American League. Derringer still chilling and jawing with Passarelli. Now Passarelli motions him to go back to the mound and pitch. Derringer starts back there, climbs up on the hill. He's a big fellow, this Derringer. He's quite a competitor. The count he has on Greenberg, who is equally big, is 3-1. Of course, Hank doesn't weigh quite as much as Derringer does. 
But you put them uh, both together on the same side of a teeter board, and they'll hold it down for you. There, Derringer goes quickly to first base, trying to pick off Kramer, but Doc is in in time. Now he throws three and one to the plate to Derringer, and it's a high curve for ball four. Greenberg is walked. That pushes Kramer down to second. That's the third base on balls given up by Derringer. His control has been responsible for two of them. He was ordered to uh, walk uh, Cullenbein in the first inning. Now the batter standing in for Detroit is Cullenbein. He was walked purposely in his first at bat. So he's coming up for his first official turn right now. Runners at first and second in two odds. Cullenbein takes a sweeping curve that's low and down by his shins. The ball one. Mickey Livingston came up very nicely with that pitch. Now Derringer gets ready, sights, serves, and the fast one is low. That's ball two. Set the Cubs for you defensively now. Derringer on the mound, Livingston behind the plate. At first is Cavaretta, at second is Don Johnson. At third is Stanley Hack, and at short is Roy Hughes. Lowry is in left field, Pat going center, and Bill Nicholson in right. Now the runners take their lead as Derringer throws to a nothing, swung on, beaten down into the ground foul, and that's strike one. Derringer's ready. Roy started this ball game for the Cubs. He was belted out in the first inning. Derringer has come on, and he's out there throwing now for the Cubs. He's throwing uh, two and one to Roy Cullenbein. Two outs and two on here for Detroit in second. Columbine swings on a high curve and misses it. Strike two. So the count on Roy Columbine, the Detroit right fielder, is two balls, two strikes. There are two outs, two on in the second inning. That's a flock of deuces. Now Derringer's ready. Now he comes with the two and two pitch and misses with it high for ball three. Now it's a three and two situation. Roy Cullenbine, who is a pretty good clutch hitter. The score is five to one in favor of Detroit, as it now stands, but they're threatening here in the second inning. Derringer delivers three two and Cullenbine swinging on it, fouls it back at first base on the ground. The other count stays right on at three and two. Steve O'Neill running his ball club from behind third base in the coach's box there. Puts on all kinds of signs. Columbine standing outside a batter's box watching him, too. He wants to get everything the boss has to say. Now we're all ready. Derringer throws three and two. Columbine takes, and it's high and outside for ball four. And that is the fourth base on balls given up by Derringer. And the second time, and Columbine has been walked. So Greenberg moves down to second, and Kramer, with two outs, moves over to third. So Derringer's gotten himself in a little bit of trouble here by his own wildness. The bases are loaded with Tigers in the second. And the batter is Rudy York. The big kickapoo takes a fast one in there for a strike. That Derringer and that York, there are a couple of fellows about the same size. All over his head easily, kicks, throws. Rudy at the plate takes a fast one in there again for a strike. That was pulled over the inside corner just above the knees. Derringer looks down at Mickey Livingston. The Chicago catcher sets him it up as a target. Here comes the 0-2 delivery. York takes it, and it's just under his knees for ball one. The bases are completely populated here in the second inning. Kramer's at third, Greenberg at second, and Cullen Bynum at first. There are two away. Rudy York up there with a count of one ball, two strikes. Derringer throws to him, and York sits down into the dirt at a high curve. Came right off the point of his chin. So the count on York now is two balls, two strikes. Derringer taking his time now as he studies the situation very carefully. It's a two and two count on Rudy York. Derringer throws, York swings, and there's a ball hit out back of right field, and it falls off foul by about five feet. It was a line drive spiked by Rudy York. He hit a high outside pitch and dumped it out back of right field. So the count stays right on to Rudy at two and two. York's a little base hit hungry. He'd like to get himself a hold of one. Of course, Derringer has other ideas as he gets ready for this next two and two delivery. Down it rides. York swings on it and gets just enough of it to tip it foul. 
Scoots back on the ground all the way to the screen. Now the count on York is two and two. The count in the ball game is Detroit five and Chicago one. Berenger hasn't uh, waded through the tall grass here yet in the second inning. He's having himself a little trouble. He winds, throws two and two. York takes a high curve for ball three. Now it's three and two. It's gone right down to the wire and with Mickey Livingston. Fired that ball back to the mound. Paul Berenger sort of snapped it right out of the air with his gloved hand. He's a little mad at himself out there at the mound right now. The three and two count on Rudy York. The base is loaded and two outs. We're in the top of the second inning. Berenger throws three two. And it's taken by Rudy York on the inside for ball four. So another Detroit run is pushed across the plate. As Doc Kramer comes over to score from third base. Bases remain loaded as Greenberg takes his station at third. And Cullenbine moves down to second. That is rock number five and run number two given up by Derringer. And the score stands now at six for Detroit and one for Chicago. And I think that's going to be all for big Paul Derringer. Yes, he's coming out of there now on high Vandenberg. Another right-hander is going to come on to pitch for Chicago. So Derringer is all through. He came in and pitched the first inning after uh, Barrelli couldn't get anyone out. So he pitched one inning and two-thirds of the second. So he's pitched one and two-third innings. And he's out of there. This is not Derringer's ball game to lose, should it wind up this way. Because he came in with his ball club behind. Now stands at Barrelli's game. But High Vandenberg is coming on here. B A N D E N B E R G. I Vandenberg pitching in the second inning. The two away and the bases loaded, and he'll throw first of all to Outlaw, the third baseman. As far as Vandenberg is concerned, here in this World Series, he has pitched two and two third innings in relief. He's given up a couple of bases on balls. He struck out no one. He's won none, lost none. So Vandenberg takes the mound for Chicago. And he's the third pitcher for Charlie Graham. Jimmy Outlaw steps up there with the bases loaded. Greenberg at third, Helen Brown at second, and York at first. It's a sixth to one ball game in favor of Detroit. Vandenberg delivers. Three quarter overhand pitch. It's in there for a strike. Jimmy Outlaw came up in the first inning and he too was walked. So his pregame batting percentage for the series of 167 is still intact. Vandenberg, the grab on right hander delivers. There's a swooping curveball that misses just outside. Outlaw digs back in, stands deep at the plate, holds a bat high on his right shoulder. Vandenberg twists, throws a curveball. It's hit right back to the mound. Vandenberg knocks it down with his body, then picks it up, throws it to Caparetta, and that's all for Outlaw and the Tigers in the second. So Vandenberg gets him out of there, but not before they'd scored a run. One run on one hit. Three men left and the winner wears. So at the end of one and a half innings of play, the score stands the Tigers, six, and the Cubs, one. Well, now there's a moment. I want to bring baseball's famous pinch-hitting pitcher, Red Ruffing of the New York Yankees, to the microphone. Red, the standout pitcher of the American League, is the leading World Series pitcher of all time, having won seven consecutive victories and being charged with only two defeats. Red, I wish you'd tell the fans what you told me last evening about the slick, easy shaves you get with the Gillette Blue Blade. Just what I said, Al. I can't get a decent shave with any other blade. Go on and tell them about it, Red. Okay, Al. I said your line, look sharp, feel sharp. It sums the story up for me. The fellow does look better and feel better when he shaves with that Gillette blue blade. Well, that's what I wanted you to give the fans, Red. Thanks, Red Ruffin. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette blue blades with the sharpest edges ever home. Now in the last half of the second inning, the first man up for Chicago is going to be... Bill Nicholson. Bill is hitting at 208. He has five for 24 for his work in the series. One of those hits was a triple. A very costly triple as far as Detroit was concerned because it helped them lose the first game of the series. Now Newhouser pitches and Nicholson swings viciously and fouls it way back onto the screen for strike one. And I can't help 
but wonder what uh, goes through Red Ruffing's head as he watches uh, the American Leaguers perform here this afternoon at Wrigley Field in Chicago. Red told me last night that he certainly would like to be pitching down there just any day in this series. Newhouser is throwing the over Detroit. He stops a curve and it's low to Nicholson for ball one. One and one is the count to Bill Nicholson. First man up for Chicago in the second inning. Newhouser throws a curve that Nicholson swings on and there's a high foul ball going over near the Detroit dugout. Richards, the catcher, is over and he takes it for the out. That's all for Nicholson. Fouling up and out to catcher Richards of Detroit. The batter now is Mickey Livingston. Mickey missed just one of the ball games, so he's playing his sixth game of the World Series. He's had seven hits for 18 at bats, and he is the number two hitter of all batsmen. He's going along hitting at 389. He's a right hand hitter standing deep at the plate. Takes a look at the first pitch and it's passing. Newhauser had that one right in. No balls, one strike. It's young Detroit Southpaw delivers, and Livingston hits one down to third. Outlaw picks it up on a big hop. Fires it over to Rudy York, and that's all for Livingston. Going out from third to first. Now Roy Hugh, the shortstop, is coming up. There are two outs here in the last of the second inning. The score stands Tiger six, and the Chicago Cubs one. This is the seventh and final game of the 1945 World Series. Hughes hitting right-handed, batting at 286. Newhouser tries a curve on him, and it's good. Just above the knees on the outside corner for strike one. Hughes bends over slightly from the waist. Newhauser pours a change of pace in there that's just outside. That's ball one. One ball, one strike. Newhauser throws again. This time Hughes swings on it and fouls it up into the second tier behind first base. Down in the bullpen for the Chicago Cubs, tall, blonde right-hander Paul Erickson is starting to get ready. Which leads us to believe that uh, if Hughes gets on, Vandenberg may not hit. Newhauser delivers to the plate now, and Hughes takes it, and it's a nice call strike. That's the third one. Newhauser really had it in there. Let's see, as far as strikeouts are concerned, that's the second one for Hal. So at the end of two innings of play, with nothing across here for Chicago in a second, it is the Tigers six and the Cubs one. Well, you know, each day since the opening of this World Series, we have been explaining how these games are being broadcast to our servicemen and women overseas. How through the far-flung network of the Armed Forces Radio, our play-by-play -play descriptions are being shortwaved from San Francisco to Japan and China, Alaska, South America, to the Philippines and to our Navy ships throughout the Pacific. From New York, they are beamed over the Atlantic to England, France, Germany, Italy, and to the Far East. We are happy to say that the Armed Forces Radio Service are receiving wires from all over the world telling them what the reception of the game so far has been excellent and that the men are getting a real thrill out of listening in. As one Detroiter said to a correspondent in Tokyo, this is the next thing to being out there in the bleachers if we only had some hot dogs. Yes, our bleachers this year extended clear out to Tokyo on one side and over to Berlin and Vienna on the other side. To all you men and women out there, we send our greetings and our sincere hope that you'll be back here with us when the World Series rolls around next year. Well, the third inning is rolled around here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. It's a 6-1 to ball game in favor of the Detroit Tigers as we start the first half of inning number three with Paul Richards, the Detroit catcher, up at bat. Richards doubled back in the first inning to knock in three runs for the ball club. So he probably feels very fine about it. It's high Vandenberg. Makes the first pitch. It's a fast ball strike. Livingston sets out the sign. Vandenberg takes it, throws that pitch. It's a curveball of medium speed variety low for ball one. One and one is the count on Paul Richards. He's had one hit in one try. Vandenberg tries another curve, and Richards takes it, and it's a sweeping curve that bites over the outside corner for a called strike. So that makes the count one and two on the Detroit catcher. Vandenberg pumping nervously. Now throws. A curveball. It's in there for called strike three. And that's all for Richards. He took it with his bat on his shoulder. That's the first strikeout against Detroit this afternoon. And high Vandenberg, the third of the Chicago pitchers, hangs it up. Batter coming up now is Hal Newhauser. 
Al came up in the first inning and grounded down to the right side, and Johnson, the second baseman of the Cubs, threw him out. Al hitting left-handed. Stands very deep at the plate. Vandenberg curves him, and misses with it just outside and low for ball one. Newhauser has 0 for 5 as a batsman in the series, so he has no batting percentage. He swings on the next pitch. It's a change of pace curve. Hit down to the right side. Johnson at second picks it up on the right side of the diamond and puts it into Cavaretta, and that's all for Newhauser, going out from second to first, just as he did in the first inning. So that's the second out now for Detroit, here in the first half of inning number three. Skeeter Webb is coming to the plate now. He's had one hit and two tries. He got a single to right back in the first inning, if you recall. Vandenberg tries a three-quarter overhand curve on him. And it's outside for ball one. Webb standing forward at the plate this time. It's as close to the pitcher as he can. He swings on the next pitch and beats it down foul. To the left of the plate, and it rolls back toward the Chicago dugout. So the count now on Skeeter Webb is one ball, one strike. Two outs. Top of the third inning, and the score stands at 6-1 to one in favor of Detroit over Chicago. Vandenberg's ready, now hustles his pitch down there, and Skeeter Webb swings on a wide curve and doesn't get it. That's strike two. He really reached for it, too. He wanted to hit that one. One ball, two strikes. Webb's always nervous with that bat at the plate. He pumps it back and forth. Now he swings on this next pitch, hits a slow roll at a shortstop. Hughes comes in nicely, picks it up, throws it to Cavaretti in time by a stride. And that is all for Webb, going out from short to first. So in the third inning for Detroit, no runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left. And the score, Detroit 6 and Chicago 1. Red Ruffing, stalwart Yankee pitcher, speaking from this booth last inning, told you about the slick, easy shaves he gets with today's Gillette Blue Blade. Now, there are millions of shavers just as enthusiastic as Red Ruffing about this finest of razor blades. In fact, the Gillette Blue Blade is number one in preference the world over because it's number one in sharpness. Yes, today's Gillette Blue Blade has the sharpest edges ever honed. So sharp, so smoothly finished, so easy shaving, that tough beard's no problem at all. It's mighty easy to check, old Al. Just ask for Gillette Blue Blades and see how quick and how easy and how smooth and refreshing shaving can be. Man, what shaves you get. Remember, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. We pause now 10 seconds for station identification. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago, serving the Middle West. Hi, Vandenberg is to be the first hitter for Chicago here in the last of the third inning. Vandenberg's coming up to the plate right now. Matter of fact, he has no hits, no at-bats here in the series. He takes the first pitch high for ball one. So this is his first official at-bat in the 1945 series. Newhauser comes down with the next delivery, and Vandenberg swings and doesn't get it. He's spun all the way around. So the count on Vandenberg now is one ball, one strike. First Cub up in the third inning. Al Newhauser working very well for Detroit. Delivers. Vandenberg swings. Hits a high fly ball out into right field. Up under it is Cullen Vine, and he's got it for the out. That's all for Vandenberg. A fly ball to right field to Roy Cullen Vine. That brings up the second hitter. And starting the second batting around for Chicago is Stanley Hack. He was struck out in the first inning. He's had 11 hits and 26 at-bats here in this 1945 series. Newhauser works. Hack takes, and there's a low curve on the outside for ball one. If Stanley Hack can get himself another base hit in this World Series, he will tie Eddie Rice of Washington and Pepper Martin of the St. Louis Cardinals for 12 hits in a single series. Vandenberg tries, or rather, Newhauser tries a curve, and it's outside to Hack for ball two. Two balls, no strikes. We're in the last half of the third inning. The score is six to one in favor of Detroit. And one out for Chicago. No base runners. And Stanley Hack is up there for his second at bat. Newhauser's uh, kind of stingy with the Cubs. He's given them only two hits. He throws a curve in there now, and Hack walks up on it and then takes it, and it's nicely in for a strike. Now his count is two balls, one strike.
Newhouser comes down with a fast one. It's in there. Ball strike two. Just above the hack knees and on the outside corner. Now the count on the Chicago third baseman is two balls, two strikes. Hack watches Newhouser get ready. Then swings on his offering and hits a ball down to third. Outlaw comes up with it behind third. Throws to first. And that's all for Hack. Hack going out. Third to first, being thrown out by his opposing third baseman, Jimmy Outlaw. So that's the second out here in the last half of inning number three. The batter now is Johnson. Johnson got one of the two hits given up so far by Newhouser when he doubled in the left center field back in the first inning. Newhouser throws a medium speed curveball in there that's swung on by Johnson and fouled off to the right of the plate. Strike one. A new Houser with a new ball is ready. New Houser fogs a fast one in there. It's hit back past the mound, back to second. Skidder Webb rides behind second, makes the pick up, and the throw to first nicely for the out. And that's all for Johnson. Going out from short to first, being thrown out by Skeeter Webb. So there's nothing across for the Cubs here in the last half of the third inning. No runs, no hits, no errors, and nobody left. The score at the end of three innings of play in the seventh game of the 1945 World Series is Detroit 6. And Chicago won. As a matter of fact, Detroit has six runs on a total of five hits. They have committed one error. While for the Chicago Cubs, they have one run on a total of two hits off Newhouser, and they have committed no errors. So we're headed for the top of the fourth inning here at Wrigley Field in Chicago. And High Vandenberg, the third of the Chicago pitchers, has taken the mound, and he'll throw first of all in the fourth inning to Eddie Mayo. Eddie Mayo will be followed by Doc Kramer and then by left fielder Hank Greenberg. Mayo has been up twice in this ball game and has had one hit in two attempts. Back in the first inning, he got a single to right field. In the second inning, Mayo fly to center. Kramer hasn't been stopped so far today. He's had two hits, a single to left and a single to right in his two at-bats. And then Hank Greenberg sacrificed successfully in the first and was walked in the second. So Greenberg hasn't been up there really officially. Now Mayo steps in, hitting left-handed, opens his stance slightly toward first base. Vandenberg, right on right-hander delivers, and there's a fastball swung on and beaten down into the ground foul. Rolls back toward the dead dugout. The first set strike one on Eddie Mayo. This is the ninth seven-game series to be played, and six of eight have been won by the National League. Vandenberg tries a low curl this time. Change of pace variety, and it's by one. One by one strike to count on Eddie Mayo. Vandenberg comes right back with a one and one offering, and it's a curveball that hangs outside the ball, too. One one. That's the count on Eddie Mayo. The first Tiger up. Fourth inning. A fastball is swung on by Mayo and missed completely for strike one. Rather, strike two. Two balls, two strikes. That was the first one he swung at in that manner. Two balls, two strikes is the count on Eddie Mayo. First man up for Detroit here in the fourth inning. Vandenberg delivers two and two. There's an easy curve. It's in there for call strike three. That's all for Mayo. That for Vandenberg is strikeout number two. He's the only uh, Chicago Cup pitcher. He's been able to do any business in that strikeout department with Detroit this afternoon. Now the batter is Buck Kramer. He's had two hits and two tries. Left-handed batter. Takes the first pitch and it crosses him. He's right in there, just under the lettering of the shirt, right through the middle. Vandenberg rolls back, comes down with a change of place curve that's reached for, and there's a high pop out back at shortstop. Hughes goes back about 15 feet on the grass and left field and grabs it for the out. It's off for Kramer, so he's been stopped now. That's the second out, the top of the fourth inning. That brings up Hank Greenberg for his first official at bat. His pregame batting percentage of 333 is still right. Look at that outfield move back when Greenberg digs in. Larry moves back and left. Half go, moves over into left center, and moves way back. Vandenberg tries to curve on him. Greenberg takes it. High for ball one. 
Nicholson is over almost into right center field. Big hole in right field on near the line. Vandenberg throws and Greenberg takes. There's an inside curve just off the short ribs for ball two. Two balls, no strikes. Ty Vandenberg blows on the fingers of his pitching hand. Now grips that ball. Steps up, delivers. Low for ball three. Over count on Greenberg now. Three balls, no strikes. He looks around to third base, Steve O'Neill, to see whether or not he's going to be allowed to go for this 3-0 pitch. Vandenberg makes it, but it's taken. It's in for a strike. 3-1. Greenberg waves that war club back and forth. Takes this next pitch, and it's under his knees and on the inside for ball four. So Greenberg is walked with two away here in the fourth inning. That's the first walk given up by Vandenberg. That's walk number six that has been given to the Detroit Tigers. Now the fellow that has been receiving most of the walks is Roy Cullenby. He's been the recipient of two of them, and he's up there now. Vandenberg starts to work on Cullenby and misses with a low fast one on the inside for ball one. One ball, no strikes. Greenberg steps off at first. Two away here in the top of the fourth. Cullenbine reaches for a curveball and beats it down into the ground foul. So the count now on Cullenbine is one and one. One ball, one strike. Roy well, hitting left-handed against the right-handed offerings of High Vandenberg. Greenberg steps off at first. Vandenberg's pitch the plate is swung on. There's a long line drive foul out back of right field. Cullenbine also broke his bat on that one. Fell away from an inside hook and tried to pull it into right, but pulled it too much. Well, the count is one and two on Cullenbine. One ball, two strikes. And a little time has been called here now to allow Cullenbine to walk over to the Tiger dugout, select his favorite piece of lumber. Comes trudging back up to the plate with that little slugger he carries over his shoulder. Gets in there now. Count is one ball, two strikes on Roy Cullenbine. Two outs in the top of the fourth, and Hank Greenberg, who was walked, is on at first. Vandenberg delivers. There goes Greenberg. The ball is swung on and missed and dropped by Mickey Livingston, but he makes the peg down to third, to first base in time, and it's a strikeout nevertheless. Cullenbine is out of there. So Vandenberg hangs up strikeout number three, and here in the fourth inning, no runs. No hits, one man left, and there were no errors. So at the end of three and a half innings of play, the score stands Tigers six and the Cubs one. Well, we all like to watch a pitcher who can fog them through. Yes, speed's a great thing when it's combined with perfect control. Speed counts for plenty in shaving, too, when it's hooked up with real comfort. Now, that's the kind of shaving you get when you use Gillette Brushless Shaving Cream. Gillette Brushless removes moisture-resisting oil from your whiskers almost instantly. What's more... It blankets a barrel of water against them, giving every bristle a thorough soak. Yes, you let brushless soften, stubble, and jig time. It stays wet on your face. Lubricate your blade and make shaving lots quicker and easier. For extra shaving speed and comfort, ask your dealer for Gillette Brushless. If he's out of stock today because of wartime shortages, he'll have Gillette Brushless soon. Now for the last half of inning number four. The score stands 6-1 to one in favor of the Tigers over the Cubs. And Peanut Lowry is coming up for his second at bat here in the seventh game. He's over one. He was a base runner in the first inning when Newhouser bobbled his attempted sacrifice. Now Hal out on the mound makes the pitch, and there's a nice hook in there for a strike. Little Lowry gets down, gets a double handful of dirt. Former GI waves that bat back and forth now. Newhouser cuts the pitch loose, and Lowry takes it high. That's ball one. One ball, one strike. Newhouser works again. Lowry swings on it, and there's a fly ball going out into right center field. Going over for it is Doc Kramer. Cullenbine cuts in front of him and takes it for the out. So on right center field, it was Roy Cullenbine who streaked in front of Doc Kramer to make the put out. That's one away in the last of the fourth inning for the Chicago Cubs. Well, Bill Cavaletta has hit in the only run so far for Chicago today. 
And he's coming up now. Galbraith had a single in the first inning to right field. The folks here are being asked to remove the blankets from the wall in deep center field. Now they've done so, and the ball game is going to go on. Newhauser throwing left-handed, of course. Makes his first pitch, and it's a curveball that stays outside to a left-hand hitter, Phil Cabaretta, for a ball one. Newhauser tries again, and Cabaretta laces this one out in the center field. It's dropping in for a base hit. Doc Kramer picks it up on the third skip and fires it into Eddie Mayo, the second baseman. Cabaretta is on with a solid hit in the center. That's hit number three off Newhauser. And the batter is Andy Patko, and the stands here at Chicago very suddenly come to life. Patko hit into a double play back in the first inning. He'd like to atone for that right now. He swings on the first pitch and has a fly ball to center. Doc Kramer goes back into his right and misjudges it. The ball falls behind him. Here comes Cabaretta moving into third. Charlie Grimm is waving him on in. There comes a throw to the plate. Cabaretta slides. The ball gets away from Richards. The runner is safe. And Pat goes at third. Well, Doc Kramer out in deep center field misjudged a uh, fly ball that was carried by the wind, and it winds up as a triple for Pat Cole to score Cabaretta all the way from first. And the throw that came into the plate was low and into the dirt, and Richards couldn't pick it up. Now here is Bill Nicholson. Newhauser delivers, and Nicholson swings and misses for strike one. That was hit number four and run number two off Newhauser. It's now a 6-2 to two ball game. Al delivers, and Nicholson at the plate takes low and on the outside for ball one. One ball, one strike. That's the count on Nicholson. He fouled up and out in the second inning to Richards. So he's 0 for 1 for this game. Newhauser delivers a fast curve under the knees of Nicholson for ball two. Two balls, one strike. There's one out for Chicago here in the fourth. They're trying to get back into this ball game as the score stands Detroit six and Chicago two. Papko leads down off third. Nicholson swings and hits the ball easily back to the mile. Newhauser drives the runner back into third, throws to first in time, and that's all for Nicholson. He topped the swing and rolled it back toward the mound. Nicholson thrown out by Newhauser. Papko holding on at third base. The batter is Livingston now. Livingston came up in the second inning and was thrown out by third baseman Outlaw. Now Newhauser is ready to deliver to him. He checks path go at third, goes to the plate, and is swung on, missed, or strike one. Livingston was going after a high inside curve. Mickey's a right-handed hitter. As we told you, he is the number two hitter in the series as far as batsmen are concerned. He's had seven hits for 19 tries. Now Newhauser is ready. Delivers 0 and 1 to the plate. And there's a ball hit right back to the mound. Newhauser grabs it very quickly. Throws it over to first. And that's all for Livingston. That's all for the Chicago Cubs here in the fourth inning. So, despite the triple, Newhauser got out of it rather uh, easily. Very inexpensively. One run, two hits. One man left and there were no errors. So at the end of four full innings of play, the score stands... Six for the Tigers. Before we get into the top half of the fifth inning, I'd just like to remind you that for a rousing time, get your friends together Friday nights and enjoy a parking good scrap on Gillette's Cavalcade of Sports. Yes, for the major boxing event of the week, every week, the year round, tune in Gillette's Cavalcade of Sports Friday nights. Consult your newspaper for a local station and local time. Now for the first half of inning number five. This is quite a knockdown, drag out ball game with the Chicago Cubs and the Detroit Tigers fighting for the World's Championship here in the seventh game of the 1945 World Series at Wrigley Field in Chicago. 
The first man up for Detroit here in the fifth inning is going to be Rudy York. He twice has been up there, but just once officially. He came up in the first inning and popped up and out to third baseman Stan Hack. Then in the second inning, he was walked. So York is coming up actually for his second official at bat. He's 0 for 1. No hits in one try. Out on the mound, High Vandenberg, pitching for the Chicago Cubs, has visited to Rosenbach, and he's ready to throw. Rudy York, big, powerful right-hand hitter, very thick set through the chest and shoulders, watches the first pitch whistle in, and it's low for ball one. It's a 6-2 ball game in favor of the Tigers. Vandenberg twists and throws an overhand curve that's swung on and fouled off by York for strike one. One ball, one strike. That's the count on Rudy York. York looks down at O'Neill behind third. These ball players very carefully watch their manager because with each pitch, signs are changed. Vandenberg delivers one and one. It's a medium speed curveball. It's over for a strike. Now it's one and two. One ball, two strikes. York waits. Vandenberg serves. York swings, and there's a bounding ball to third. Hack is up with it. There's a throw over to Cabaretta at first, and that is all for York. Bouncing out from third to first. Well, that's one away here in the top of the fifth inning. The batter coming up there now for Detroit is Jimmy Outlaw. He walked in the first, hit back to the mound, and was thrown out by the pitcher in the second inning. So Outlaw has gone up there once officially and has failed to get a hit. Vandenberg throws a curve in there that Outlaw, the little right-handed hitter, swings on and fouls right back onto the screen for strike one. Outfield immediately when Outlaw comes up there. Walks in a couple of steps. Vandenberg now with one away in the fifth delivers, and Outlaw almost took a swing at that one, but pulled up in time to take it low for ball one. One ball and one strike is the count on third baseman Jimmy Outlaw of the Detroit Tigers. Vandenberg, big right-hander throws, and it's swung on and hit just over the outstretched fingertips of Hughes, not into left field for a base hit. So Outlaw singles right over shortstop, out in the left. That's hit number six, as far as Detroit is concerned, and now they have an equal number of runs and hits. Batter is Paul Richards. Richards doubled in the first inning, struck out in the third. Now he takes a curveball. It's good for a strike. No balls, one strike. That's a count on Richards. He's turning, he turns around and really talking to Passarella. He didn't like to call on that one a bit. In five and the third innings, that was the first hit off Vandenberg. Down comes the next pitch. There goes the runner down to second base. The pitch to the plate is swung on for strike two. The plate goes down to second. The flying spikes of Outlaw slides under the peg, and he's safe at second. So he'll get credit with a stolen base. Outlaw is credited with a steal of second. Richard swung to protect him, and of course that's strike two on Paul. But the Tigers have another base runner in scoring position. They've won away here in the top of the fifth inning. Vandenberg is ready now, delivers. Richards takes a curveball. It snaps off outside for ball one. One ball, two strikes. That Outlaw was really digging that time. He stole second. The little short legs of his pumping and chopping up and down. Covers a lot of ground. Vandenberg delivers to the plate, and Richards takes a low curve on the inside for ball two. Now it's a count of two balls, two strikes on Paul Richards. One out for Detroit in the top of the fifth inning. Outlaw singled and stole second, and he's now on at the keystone. His hands on his hips right now as he takes a short lead. Looks around behind him to make sure no one's sneaking in behind him to take him off. Now Vandenberg is ready. Delivers two and two. Richards leans forward toward it and then jerks himself back and takes ball three. Three balls, two strikes. That's the count on Paul Richards, the Detroit catcher. Vandenberg ready with the three-two delivery. Checks out Law at second. Now throws Platewood. Richard swings on it. There's a high foul ball way back into the second tier behind first base. Wood count stays at three and two. Score in case you just tuned in. 
Detroit six and Chicago two. We're in the top half of the fifth inning. One out, outlawed second. Richards at the plate, count of three and two, and he swings on the next pitch. Hits it down to Stanley Hack. The runner is driven back into second. Hack's throw across the diamond is in time, and that's all for Richards. Going out from third to first. Outlaw holding right on at second. The batter now is Hal Newhauser. Up until now, Hal Newhauser has pitched himself a pretty sharp game. He's been looking sharp down there. It's left-handed. However, as a batsman, he's gone over two. He swings on the first one, a big jug handle curve. Missed it for strike. No balls, one strike is the count on Hal Newhauser. Two outs. Outlaw still on at second. Vandenberg delivers. Newhauser swings on the next pitch, and there's a fly ball hit out into left field. Larry has to hurry. He does and makes the catch. Larry had to come up in a big hurry and over toward the line in left field, but he was right there. Made the catch, so there are no runs. One hit, and a man left, and there were no errors. So at the end of four and a half innings of play, the score stands, the Tigers six, and the Cubs two. Folks, peace has plenty of blessings. Among them is the thrill we all get at seeing the good things we've missed during the war reappear. So when I tell you that the famous easy-shaving Gillette Tech razor is coming back on dealers' counters all over the country, I can just hear a lot of you fellas say, hot dog. Now, most stores have the Gillette Tech in stock right now, and you'll probably find one where you trade. So be on the lookout for the Gillette Tech razor you and plenty of other men have been waiting for. It's on the way with all-metal gold-plated head, plus five super-keen Gillette blue blades at the popular pre-war price of only 49 cents. What shaves you get, how quick and how easy, how smooth and how refreshing. Yes, happy shaves are here again. Ask your dealer for your Gillette Tech Razor with five perfect shaving Gillette blue blades at 49 cents. And now for the last portion of the seventh game of the 1945 World Series, the close-up shop, put it in the books, is a guy that can do it, Bill Slater. You ready, Bill? Thank you, Al. Yep. Roy Hughes is the first batter up for the Cubs here in the last of the fifth. Whispering Roy struck out his first time up. 24-year-old Hal Newhouser gets ready to pitch to Hughes. Here it comes. Hughes backs away from it. It's an inside pitch for ball one. Jolly Charlie Grimm with his team trailing by four runs is cutting up capers galore down in that third base coaching box. He wants Hughes to hit and get on. Hughes swings, foul tips it. Strike one. One ball, one strike. Don't go away, y'all. This game isn't over yet. 62, the Tigers are out in front, and Hal Newhauser, the best of their pitchers, is looking mighty keen. Just the same, these Cubs are fighting back. Newhauser works. It's good. The third ball gets the inside corner. And Hughes is sore about it. He throws his bat down and walks away from the plate, and Charlie Grimm comes walking in from third, and he's not happy now. It was a curveball. Nipped the inside corner. Now Hughes and Passarella have got themselves a bit of a run to lay on down there. Hughes is sticking his chin out at Passarella. Passarella's talking right back to him, too. That Passarella was a military policeman in the Army. Now Hughes picks his bat up again, and meanwhile, out on the mound, Hal Newhouser is flailing his arms around like a windmill, trying to keep warm. It's a cool day. Here they are, ready to go again. Here's the pitch to Hughes. It's inside. Ball two. Two balls, two strikes. And a derisive roar from the crowd, who disagreed with the call on that last pitch. Two and two now on Roy Hughes. Newhouse is ready. Here it is. Hughes takes it, and it is called strike three. And Hughes is sore again. But he's out of there. That's the second time that Roy Hughes has struck out in this ball game. And for Newhouse, that is strikeout number three. Two of them he's collected off of Hughes. Now here's a pinch hitter coming up in place of High Vandenberg. It's Eddie Sauer. Sauer stepping up there, right-handed uh, hitter. This is Sauer's second time up as a pinch hitter in the ball game, and Newhauser promptly greets him with a fast call strike, a curveball that whipped in and over. Sauer's an outfielder by trade, and he hails from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, a right-handed batter. One strike on him. Newhauser works down low into the dirt, scooped up by Richards. The crowd, hooping a bit, they are giving Passarella a bit of a resolute. One and one on Sauer. That pitch is high at the ball, too. S-A-U-E-R. 
Eddie Seller. Newhouser, who has a commanding lead in this ball game, is taking plenty of time on every pitch. He's never pitched a more important battle than this in his life. Seller swings on that one, fouls it into the big netting here behind the catcher. Two balls, two strikes on Sauer. The next pitcher will either be Paso or Erickson, I believe. They both seem to be working out down there in the bullpen for the Cubs. Now a new ball put in play. Newhauser has it rubbed up. Here's the pitch. It's a little too high. Makes it ball three for a full count on Sauer, the pinch hitter. There have been more pinch hitters used in this series, as you know, than any other series in all of baseball history. Here it is. Sauer swings, strikes out. Strikeout number four for Newhauser. Two out for Chicago in the last half of the fifth. And now the leadoff hitter, Stanley Hack, comes up to start the third batting around for the Cubs. And Stanley has been turned back his two previous appearances at the plate by Hal Newhauser. Hal works. Hack takes a fast call strike. Newhauser seems to be getting sharper and sharper as this game wears along. Here it comes. Hack swings on it. There's a ground ball to shortstop. Skeeter Webb scoops it out of the dirt. The throw to first is just in time. Hack is out by half a stride. So in the last of the fifth inning, there's nothing across for the Chicago Cubs. And the score at the end of five full innings of play is Detroit 6 and Chicago 2. And I believe it's big born Paul Erickson who's coming in to be the next pitcher for the Cubs. But wait till he's officially announced. He's taking the stride in, though, from out there in left field where the bullpen is located. And while Erickson is coming to the mound to complete his warm-up pitches and to appear as the fourth pitcher this afternoon for the Chicago Cubs, uh, let's pause here 10 seconds for station identification. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago serving the Midwest. Well, Charlie Graham, as you can see, is using every bit of ammunition he has in his whole arsenal to try to pull this game out of the fire. This is the fourth pitcher we've told you who came out there. As you know, but to remind you of the late tuner in you are, Hank Barrowie started the ball game, and they collected three hits in a row off of him, and that was all for him. Then big um Paul Derringer came in. He was relieved by Vandenberg in the second inning. Vandenberg pitched mighty classy ball. He gave up only one hit, the only hit he's given up in the series. And now Vandenberg was lifted in the last half of the fifth inning for a pinch hitter. And so we have Braun Paul Erickson, a big right-hander. So far in this series, Erickson has appeared in three games. This is the fourth game he's come in as a pinch pitcher. He has pitched five innings and given up six hits. Erickson hails from Zion, Illinois. Stands 6'2", and he weighs 200 pounds, and he's a big, impressive figure out there on the mound. 
Getting ready to pitch now to Jimmy Webb, the right-handed hitting shortstop. And he feeds him a call strike. That was a fastball that took the inside corner waist high. Webb is starting the fourth batting around for the Tigers. Erickson works sidearm, and Webb fouls it off for strike two. The ball's two strikes on Jimmy Skeeter Webb. The Skeeter's got his three-year-old little daughter, Carol Ann, here. She's a nice-looking kid. Two strikes on Carol Ann's papa. Swings on that one. There's a fly ball going into center field. In comes Papco. He's under it now and takes it for the out and falls to one knee after he does so, but I don't think he's hurt. Nope. So Webb is out of there. Andy Papco in center field's okay. That's one away for Detroit now in the top of the sixth inning. And this is a tense battle, and you can tell by the fact that you don't get too much noise in the background except when there's a cup rally on that these Chicago fans are pulling, pulling, pulling for their team. Now here's Eddie Mayo stepping up, batting left-handed. Takes a call strike. Erickson was very fast with the curveball, just above the knees on the outside corner. Mayo bats left-handed. He's one for three in this game. Backs away from an inside pitch that's low by the shins. Ball one. One ball, one strike. Mayo usually parks his chewing gum on that button on the top of his cap, but I haven't seen him doing it in the World Series. This is a little bit too serious to be parking gum on your cap. One and one on Mayo. Erickson pitches sidearm. It's too high. Ball two. Al is taking a look at the Mayo through his glasses, and just to keep all the reporting straight, the gum's up there. Todd Spodkins. I bet it freezes. Two balls, one strike on Mayo as Erickson takes plenty of time for this next pitch. Now the big guy winds up, delivers. Mayo swings on it. There's a fly ball going into left field. Off to his left is Lowry, and on the run, he makes a good catch. That was a pretty deep hit ball. Peanuts Lowry, starting with the crack of the bat, was running back into his left. And back almost to that vine-covered wall out there, he made the catch. Mayo is out, and that's two out for Detroit now in the top of the sixth inning. And here's Doc Kramer, who has been pretty sensational today. He's gone two for three. He now has ten hits, and that's more than any other Tiger. Swings on one, slaps it down the left field line, foul. Goes over into the stands. A dozen and one people stand up and reach their fingers up to try to catch that. Can get a broken finger that way. One strike on Doc Kramer from Manahawk in New Jersey. The fox hunter. Swings on that one, slaps it out in the center field. There's another hit for him. The ball rolls out to Papco in center field, and he throws it back into second. And Kramer is on with his third hit of the afternoon. That, of course, is the first hit off Erickson. And the batter coming up is Greenberg. And there's a stir in the stands as Big Hank advances to the plate. Hank has been walked twice today, and he's been walked six times in the series. His first time up this afternoon, he sacrificed successfully. So Big Hank, the long ball hitter, who has slugged out two home runs and three doubles, steps up there. And he gets a call strike. Erickson was sharp with a fast curve just below the shoulders to Mr. Greenberg. Hank's got one of his wrists taped up today. Here it is. Greenberg takes it outside. One ball, one strike. And Peanuts Lowry has gone so deep out in the left field that you can barely see the little fella. He's backed up there. It was over his head that Hank Greenberg slugged that one yesterday. Here it comes. Greenberg takes another call strike. And Hank, who's usually pretty genial, looks a little bit uh, irritated at that. Two strikes on him. The outfield plays Greenberg so that there's a big hole between center field and right field. They pull him around to the left. He's a right-handed slugger and a full hitter. Kramer leads off first, two out. There's a throw to first. Kramer hops back on. For all of his 39 years, Doc Kramer says he's going to continue to play baseball until somebody beats him out of there. That's the spirit. Greenberg fouls that one off. Lands in the big fishing net here behind the catcher. Count is still one ball, two strikes. On Henry Greenberg. I think that's the first time in this series he's been called Henry. Erickson works. There's Kramer breaking for second. The pitch is outside. Livingston has a hard time holding it, and Kramer goes on down to second unmolested, and it's a stolen base for him. That's the third stolen base for the Tigers in this series, and the second one today. Helen Bein, Outlaw, and Kramer have now all pilfered a bag. 
The Cubs, on the other hand, have two stolen bases. Johnson and Papco snitch them. Alan Greenberg has two balls, two strikes. Now, big Paul Erickson in that spanking white uniform of his stretches. Delivers to Greenberg, who strikes out. Or you could get elected mayor of Chicago by striking out Greenberg today. That's all for the Tigers at the top of the six. No runs ahead of man left on, and there were no errors. So as we head to the last of the six, the stars, Detroit six, Chicago two. Fans, doesn't it stand to reason that Gillette, of all folks, has the resources, experience, and skill to produce the kind of shaving cream that you want, the kind that softens your beard thoroughly and makes shaving more comfortable? Well, take it from yours truly, that's just what Gillette Lather Shaving Cream does. It makes a rich, moisture-laden lather that holds a barrel of water and releases it freely, soaking every bristle and keeping your whiskers soft all the while you shave. Your razor glides like a feather. You get shaves that are shaved. Men, Gillette Lather Shaving Cream stays wet on your face and keeps your whiskers properly conditioned while you shave. Moreover, it's kind to your skin and has a fleeting fragrance that men prefer. You get cleaner, smoother, better-looking shaves, and you save money, too, when you use Gillette Lather Shaving Cream a quarter. The last half of the sixth inning, and Chicago, trailing by four runs, finds that the chances are running out. The sands of time are working against them. And they have, in the regulation distance, four more times at bat to salvage this ball game. As the Tigers march out of Wrigley Field, world's champions for 1945. Now Newhouser is flailing that arm around of his. And here's Johnson up, a right-handed hitter who is one for two. And there's a call strike, a beautiful curve by Newhouser. Ooh, that fellow has stuff. One strike on Don Johnson. Johnson doubled in the first inning. Swings on that one, fouls it off. Two strikes. He lands on the net behind the catcher. Paul Richards. Richards comes from Waxahachie. He tells me that's the way to pronounce it down in Texas. We've been calling it Waxahachie, and we apologize now to every citizen of Waxahachie. Two strikes on Johnson. Now Richards of Waxahachie gives the signal to Newhouser. He's ready to go. Johnson swings, strikes out. That is strikeout number five for Newhouser. Newhouser struck out one in the first inning, one in the second. None in the third, none in the fourth, two in the fifth, and now one in the sixth. The batter now is Peanuts Lowry, a right-handed hitter who is all for two today. Peanuts crouches, swings, snaps it out into left field. It's a single. Greenberg coming up to field it, out of it for a minute. But Lowry, after taking a sharp turn at first, goes back to first. It's a single for Peanuts, and it is hit number five off Newhouser. And Cabaretta, who's had a hit every time this afternoon, steps up to the plate. Paul now has 10 hits in this series out of 24 times up. He's had two doubles and a homer. The pitch turn is low and outside. Ball one. Newhouser will be pitching with extreme care to Phil Cabaretta, the star first baseman and the National League's batting champion. Lowry leads off first. Here's the pitch. Fine outside, curve that broke away. Ball two on Cabaretta. You can hear the ascending roar of the fans here in Wrigley Field as again the Cubs start a threat. That's a call strike. Three quarter speed curve ball that hooked over there for Newhouser. Cabaretta took it. Two and one. Outfield is straight away but deep on Cabaretta. He swings on a low breaking curve and misses it. That's that low outside curve that Cabaretta swung on three or four times I can think of in the series. Now Newhouser watches Lowry at first, delivers the plate. Cabaretta takes it. Ball three. Now it's a full count. Three and two. And Grimm coaching at third, bends over, puts his hands on his knees, and he's not jolly now. He's stern and tense. Newhouser stretches. Here's the three and two pitch. It's swung on. There's a fly ball. Popped into center field. In comes Kramer. He comes up to it and catches it. And Lowry's going to have to hurry to get back to first, but does so. 
Cabaretto's out on a fly to short center field that Doc Kramer had to come rustling in to get. Lowry remains at first. There are two out. And here's Andy Papko, who has hit the extremes in his batting today. The first time up, he hit into a double play. The last time, back in inning number four, he got a triple to center field. He's a right-handed hitter, is Andy. He's one of the six Papko brothers from up Wisconsin way. You know how it pitches him? It's good. Fast curve midway between the waist and knees. And he took it. One strike. There's strike two. That was a fast curve on the inside corner. Pasco crowds the plate just a little. He wasn't sure of that one. Two strikes. Pasco's had six hits. 26 times up in this series. That one's low into the day. Ball one. One ball, two strikes. Two out, a runner at first. Harold Newhauser stretches, delivers, and he strikes out. So, that goes out of there, and that's strikeout number six for Newhauser. He struck out two of them this inning, and he struck out two in inning number five. So in the last half of the sixth inning, no runs for Chicago. One hit, one base runner left on, and there are no errors. So the score at the end of six full innings of play is Detroit six and Chicago two. That makes for uh, Mr. Newhouser in the series eight. And now we move into inning number seven. And as we've said, the issue is becoming sharper and sharper with each advancing inning. And now there are only three innings left. The Tigers are out in front six to two. And on the mound, Erickson is completing his warm-up pitches. Behind the plate is Mickey Livingston, the fiery guy from South Carolina. And at first is Cabaretta, and at second is Johnson, and at shortstop is Roy Hughes, whispering Roy. And at third is the great Stan Height. And in left field is little Peanuts Lowry, and in center field there's Andy Papko. And out in right field is Bad Bill Nicholson. And those are the Cubs in the field, and they're behind now. And Detroit threatens to take the series from them, as they did ten years ago. Now the first Detroit batter in inning number seven is Roy Cullenbine. He has been walked seven times in this series, and he struck out twice. Today he's been walked twice and struck out once. That was his last time up. Pitch to him is low and outside by Paul Erickson, ball one. Cullenbine, big and husky, can hit from either side of the plate, batting left-handed, of course, against right-handed pitching. Erickson works. It's outside. The sidearm delivery that didn't quite do what Paul wanted it to. The pitch. Good. Cullenbine started for it, checked his swing, and it was in just above the knees. Two balls, one strike now. Cullenbine, a citizen of Detroit. Quite a bowler up there, as a matter of fact. A lot of ball players like to bowl. Here's the pitch. It's inside. Ball three. Three balls, one strike now, and the first batter for Detroit in the top of the seventh. Erickson looked a little disconsolate after the call on that last one. There's no activity in the cup bullpen right now. That's a call strike on Cullen Vine, who had turned as if to start down the first. Cullen Vine has been walked more than anybody in the series. He's had seven Annie Oakleys. Now the count on him is three and two on the string. She runs out. Erickson's working. It's high, and Cullen Vine has walked again. That gives him eight walks in the series. Now, don't uh, get record-minded on that, because the record number of walks garnered by any batter in the World Series is 11. Cullen Vine's three away from that. And, of course, that was Ruth back in 26 in the seven-game series between the Yanks and the Cards. The Babe was walked 11 times. Now the batter is Rudy York. Erickson pitches him high and inside for ball one. Cullen Vine is at first. This is York's third official time up today. He hasn't hit yet. He was walked once. York in the series has been walked three times. Struck out three times, too, incidentally. Swings! Misses it. Foul tipped it. 
went curvumping into the chest protector of the umpire. One ball, one strike. Center fielder moves a little to his right, to our left on York. And Nicholson pulls over to the left, too, the right fielder. Pretty good piece of territory between Nicholson and the right field line. York swings, misses. Strike two. Rudy didn't swing with his full, full power on that. And now there is activity in the Cub bullpen. It's Ray Prim out there. Numbering up that left arm of his. One and two is Erickson's count on York. The pitch. Strike three. Ball. That's the second strikeout for Paul Erickson. Helen Vine is still at first. One out for Detroit in the top of the seventh. If you just tuned in, scores six to two in favor of Detroit. Now here's little Jimmy Outlaw. He's had one hit out of two official times up. Right-handed batter. Swings on a foul ball as Cullenbein broke for second. The ball goes down into the stands there, and Cullenbein will go back to first. That's a strike on Outlaw. Jimmy batted in a run back in inning number one by the simple process of being walked. He's batted in three runs in the series. He's had five hits out of 26 times up. Now Outlaw is ready to go again. Erickson pitches high. Ball one. One and one on little Jimmy. Who hails from down in Jackson, Alabama. He's very well liked there, and I may add, everywhere. He's a swell little guy. There's a throw over to first. Big Roy Cullenbein was not far off, and so he didn't have to do much by way of getting back. Erickson works. Cullenbein is breaking, and the ball is popped up into short center field. In comes Papco under it, and Cullenbein, halfway down to second, beats his way back to first. Papco took it on the run for the out on outlaw. Two out. Top of the seventh. Batter now is Paul Richards, right-handed hitter, who has a double out of three times up, and he has driven in three runs this afternoon and five in the series. I had a wire from down in Atlanta where he used to be the manager of the Crackers, and they said down there we affectionately call him Old Slug. So Old Slug swings and misses one. That's a strike on Paul. He's from Waxahachie, Texas, a right-handed hitter. Swings, fouls it off, falls to the ground. Now he's up again. He was sort of trying to move himself out of the way of that pitch. His bat came swinging around, and the ball caromed off his bat, and he ended up on the ground. Two strikes. Cullenbein, who was walked, is still at first, and there are two out. Erickson works. Down low into the dirt. Neatly held up by Mickey Livingston. Steve O'Neill, coaching down at third, is looking down at the ground, kicking the dirt a little bit. And I imagine at this particular point, his heart is full of joy and nervousness. Here's the pitch to Richards. He swings on it, taps out in center field. It's falling in for a hit. It's falling to the left of Papco. It's rolling to the wall out there. Here's Cullenbein rounding third. He's headed for the plate. Here comes the throw into second, and Richards lazily holds up at second with a run-producing double. second double of the afternoon for old slug Paul Richards and it's his fourth run batted in today and for Detroit it is run number seven and they lead the Cubs now by a score of seven to two there's a round of applause for Newhouse as he comes up that's left-handed and Erickson pitches him inside for ball one Paul Richards takes a lazy lead off second there not lazy in that sense he's just relaxed Newhouse swings on one, slaps it out towards center field. Papco going to his right, takes it nicely on the run. That's all for Detroit in the top of the seventh. One run on one hit. There was one base runner left on. There were no Cub errors. And the score at the end of six and a half innings of play is Detroit seven and Chicago two. Well, now, just about everybody knows genial Irish Joe Cronin of the Boston Red Sox, one of the greatest shortstops of all time. Joe, who has spent more years as a player manager than any other major leaguer, is with us here in the booth again this afternoon. Time ran short when you were on the air last Saturday, Joe, 
So let's pick up where we left off. You know, we say that the Gillette Razor and Gillette Blue Blade are the greatest shaving team on Earth. Uh, what do you say, Joe? I'm with you 100% on that, Phil. My experience, no other combination compares with it for easy shaving. Right you are, Joe. That's because the Gillette Razor and Gillette Blue Blade are made for each other and work together perfectly. Well, they sure do a sw smooth job with my whiskers every time. Well, that's putting it very straight, and thanks, Joe Cronin. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. And now it's the home half of the seventh inning. And still the Chicago fans are on their feet in the old baseball custom. Nicholson is going to be the first hitter for Chicago in the last of the seventh. And lefty Hal Newhouser, who in this series has won one and lost one, and is trying to pitch the Tigers into the World's Championship in 1945 and doing pretty handsomely right now, is on the mound. And this young 24-year-old, who's a Detroit product all the way, started his athletic career in Wilbur Wright High School up there. One of the great stars, Tiger history this year, is about to pitch to Nicholson. He does so, and Nicholson takes it. It's outside. Ball one. Bill Nicholson hasn't had a hit today. Fouled out once to the catcher, and the next time hit back to Newhouser on the mound. Swings on this one. There's a high foul up coming back into the stands. Lands on the screen and lazily rolls off. One ball, one strike on Big Bill Nicholson. Nicholson has driven in seven runs so far in this series. That's more than anybody else. Newhauser lets it go. It's high, and Nicholson fouls it off, reaching for a high three-quarter speed curveball. One ball, two strikes. Nicholson's dark complexion, he has that menacing attitude at the plate that we've described to you so many times. Art Passarella, the plate umpire, moves out there and holds, holds up the game for a second while some Tiger players in the bullpen down right field get off the field. Now Newhouse is ready to go, and here's the pitch. Nicholson swings on it. There's a bounding ball down to first. York has it. Tosses it underhand to Newhouse, who steps on first just ahead of Nicholson for the out. Nicholson is out three to one. And that's another rather smoothly executed play at first base by Rudy York, whose defensive play in the series has attracted a great deal of comment, and deservedly so, too, because Rudy, not generally known as a great fielding first baseman, has been very, very sharp here in this seven-game 1945 series. Now the batter is Mickey Livingston. Former GI, that's right-handed. New has a delivery team, and it's swung on and slapped out into left field for a hit. Greenberg fields it on the second bounce out there, and there's his good throw into second, and Livingston is on at first. That is the eighth hit in the series for Mickey Livingston, and his first one this afternoon. And Stubby Overmeyer is working in the bullpen for the Tigers now. The little short, stocky Michigan man. Mickey Livingston at first. The batter is whispering Roy Hughes. Got a lot of friends down in Cincinnati, has Hughes. Pitch to him is low and outside. Al Benson is now up and tossing the ball around in the bullpen of the Tigers also. Livingston at first with one out. Hughes attempts to bunt one that rolls foul. He was really wanting to get one down that third base line on Jimmy Outlaw, who was playing fairly deep on this right-handed hitter, and beat it out, of course. Rod Passo is throwing the ball in the bullpen of the Cubs. Both managers keeping men all warmed up. Any little old break one way or the other, they're going to make a move. Now the count on Hughes is one ball, one strike. Newhouse pitches him, and Hughes fouls it into the crowd down the right field line. Two strikes. One ball, two strikes. This fellow Hughes started his base there in the sand lots of Cincinnati where he was born. Lives in California now, however. That pitch is low into the dirt. It gets away from Richards. And going down to second is Mickey Livingston. We'll get the scoring on that for just a second. I've, in just a second, I have a hunch it was a wild pitch. It's a wild pitch. Ball was thrown into the dirt to the left of Richards, who tried to scoop it up. Then it bounced off his mask and rolled over toward the crowd here. While that was happening, Mickey Livingston was churning his way down to second. 
That's the first wild pitch that Hal Newhouse has made in the series. And one of the reasons why Hal Newhouse's production of wild pitches and his wildness has been cured as it has been in the last couple of years is that guy behind the plate, Richards. He was a cagey catcher at 37, and he's seen a lot of baseball. He's had a great deal to do with affecting the control that has made Newhouse the great left-handed pitcher of the last two years. Now the Cowan Hughes is 2-2. Two and two. Now it's 3-2 and two because that pitch was very high. The pitcher Erickson is supposed to hit next, but I imagine we'll have a pinch hitter for him if Hughes can do some business. That pitch is low into the dirt, bounces into Richards' glove. It's a walk for Hughes. I believe that's the first walk today given up by Newhauser. And here comes Frank Sikori up to be a pinch hitter. Sikori's coming up as a pinch hitter. This will be the fifth game in which Sikori has been used as a pinch hitter. And he has had two hits out of four times up. That gives him as a pinch hitter a 500 batting average, which is nothing to be sneezed at. And now there are cup runners at first and second. There's only one out, and Sikori, a right-handed batter, is standing in there. There's a curve that comes in and over for a ball strike. Sikori's a big athlete, the great big number 49 on his back. He's an outfielder. He comes from Fort Huron in the state of Michigan. He was born in Iowa. Swings, fouls it off, strike two. Newhouser in a bit of trouble here in the last half of the seventh. He's rubbing up the new ball very carefully himself. Newhouser looked very calm and cool at breakfast this morning in the hotel. Benton and Overmeyer still working in the bullpen for the Tigers. Now Sakari is ready to go again, and Newhouser has that ball rubbed up. He has two strikes on Sakari. Now he has three strikes on him, and called third strike. That was a very, very clever curveball that Newhouser hooked in there on the on two pitch, and he got Sakari, who was standing taking. That makes it two out. The batter is Hack. Smiling Stanley Camfield Hack, the Californian, who's been one of the stars of this series. That's left-handed. This is his fourth time up today, and he hasn't hit today, although he has 11 hits so far. The pitch is close to him and inside. Ball one. Livingston at second with itchy feet. Hughes at first. His itch, too. Pitch to hack is high for ball two. Two and all the count. And regardless of how this series comes out, there's a great figure in baseball at that plate down there, Stan Hack. And out on that mound is a great young left-handed pitcher. He should have a magnificent career ahead of him, Harold Newhauser. Pitching here with very little rest today. There's a call strike that he hooks in on Hack. Curveball just above the knees, nipped the outside corner to the left-handed batter. Now Mayo tries to sneak behind Livingston at second. The crowd warns him. Hack swings on that one. It goes to Outlaw down at third. He steps on third, forcing Livingston, retiring the side. Hack hits into a force out. He scored Livingston out at third to the third, third baseman, unassisted. So in the last half of the seventh inning, no runs for Chicago. One hit, two base runners left on. There were no Detroit errors. At the end of seven full innings of play, the score is Detroit seven, Chicago two. Now, when this crucial game ends this afternoon, stay tuned in for Bill Coram, famous columnist of the New York Journal-American Sports Staff. Here, a great reporter highlights today's baseball classic. Now, while we're waiting for the start of operations in the top of inning number eight, uh, let's take a little pause here, ten seconds, for station identification. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago, serving New York. Now at the end of inning number seven, 
Al has our total scores here. Detroit, seven runs, eight hits, one error. Chicago, two runs, six hits, and no errors. And now, coming into pitch for Chicago in the top of the eighth inning is Claude Passell. Passell has been, as you know, one of the great figures in this series. Pitching up in Detroit, one of the most perfect games ever held in a World Series. Passell, appearing in his third game, has pitched 15 and two-thirds innings. He's given up six hits. He has struck out three, and he has walked seven. And he is credited with one victory and no defeats in this series. When he failed to come through down here, why, he was out, and the Cubs went ahead and won the ball game, so he was not credited with a defeat, or debited, rather, with a defeat. First batter he faces is Jimmy Webb, the right-handed hitting shortstop of Detroit. Tasso pitches to him, low and inside. And Claude is working out there with a badly split fingernail on his left hand when he flagged down a uh, hot line drive the other day, which is characteristic of Tasso. Webb fouls that one off. It's a high pop-up coming back into the stands. One ball, one strike. Now down in the bullpen for Chicago is Brooklyn's Bob Chipman. A lefty. One and one is the count that the sturdy tongue-nut farmer from Mississippi Paso has on Webb. Now the count's two and one because that pitch by Paso was too high. Ball two. Passo working, short wind up, web taking, it's high, ball three. Three and one. And of course, what's up to the Cubs now is to try to get these Tigers out of here just as rapidly as possible, then come back in the two innings of the regulation length that are left to Chicago, see what they can do about this five run deficit. Here's the pitch, high and inside, ball four. Webb has walked. That's just the second walk that Skeeter has gotten in the series. And for Paso, that's the eighth man he's walked. Now the batter is Eddie Mayo. Mayo has one hit out of four times up today, and six for 27 in the series. Eddie twists his left leg away from an inside pitch for ball one. Passo, taking lots of time, takes a look at Webb, who's being held on at first by Cabaretta. Passo delivers. Here it comes. Mayor swings on it, slaps it down the left field line. A high leap by Hack won't do. The ball is rolling to the corner. It's being chased by Lowry. Here comes uh, Webb around third, coming on in to score, and holding up at second with a double is Mayo. Now the score is 8-2, to two, and Detroit has a commanding lead. Mayo is in second with a double down the left field line. Now here's Doc Kramer coming up. left hand batter who is 3-4 for this afternoon. Swainings fouls it off. Strike one. Eddie Mayo, whose double just a moment ago, drove in Webb from first after Webb had been walked, and whose double was his seventh hit. That's Mayo leading off second now. Feeling pretty good. Doc Kramer swings on that one, hits it on the ground, down to Don Johnson the second. Johnson bobbles it, picks it up, throws the first in time. And Johnson's quite a juggler. That ball bobbled away from him. He reached up in the air with his right hand, plucked it out of the air, threw it to first to get Kramer. Mayo going to third on the play. One out. Runner at third. Score, eight to two in favor of Detroit. And a stir goes through the crowd as Greenberg comes to the plate. Big hang. Greenberg has walked twice, sacrificed once, and struck out once. This is his fifth time at the plate in this ball game. Pitch is close to him and a little bit high. Ball one. And Detroit partisans here, and their numbers are not legion, are shouting for Hank to get a hit. They'd like to see him slug that long ball. Passo is walking around on the mound, kicking some dirt out of the way, blowing his breath on his hand, which he does constantly. Passo, the fifth pitcher for Chicago this afternoon, spells his name, P-A-S-S-E-A-U. Here's the pitch, Greenberg swings on it, slices it out into left field, and Lowry comes in and makes a sensational running catch on it. There's the throw to the plate as Eddie Mayo comes in to score easily with run number nine. 
Mayo had to go back to third and touch up. Lowry came in, made a running catch on that line drive of Greenberg's out in the left field, retiring Greenberg, but Mayo, speedy on his feet, came in to score, run number nine for Detroit. That makes it two out, nobody on, two runs in here in the top of the eighth inning, and up comes Cullen Vine. Cullen Vine, who has been walked eight times in this series, steps up there and fouls off the first pitch from Paso. Strike one. And so the road becomes steeper for the Cubs. Paso delivers a little high, Cullen Vine taking it for ball one. One ball, one strike. Cullen Vine has struck out and strolled three times in this game. Another pitch to him is high again for ball two. Big Roy, who got off to a slow start in the series, come through in fair fashion. He has five hits out of 21 times up. Swings on that one. There's a towering high infield pop up back on the grass under it is Johnson now at second, and he takes it for the out. That retires the side for Detroit in the top of the eighth inning. Two runs on one hit. no base runners left on, and the Mono Chicago errors. So at the end of seven and a half innings of play, the score is Detroit 9, Chicago 2. Well, it was Joe Cronin, famous for his affable way and his ready smile, who said earlier today that in his experience, no other shaving combination compares with the Gillette razor and Gillette blue blade. Now, I might add that in the Army and in the Navy, on land, on sea, and in the air, it's the Gillette razor and Gillette blue blade by overwhelming odds. Naturally so. For the Gillette blue blade and the Gillette razor are made for each other in the same factory by the same skilled craftsmen to the same high precision standards. Yes, today's Gillette blue blade and your Gillette razor are the perfectly matched shaving combination. They fit exactly, work together beautifully, and turn in the smoothest performance known in shaving. Remember, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette blue blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. Now the home half of the eighth inning. And again, Hal Newhouser returns to the mound. And again, young Prince Hal will work that left arm of his. And he has been, despite the fact that he got off in the series to a faltering start and losing that first game at Detroit, he has been in the series as through the season, the main pitching hope of the Detroit Tigers. And it's Newhouser out there today, pitching with just a couple of days rest. And now he faces Don Johnson, the second baseman of the Cubs. He bats right-handed. Johnson swings on that one. There's a high foul peeling back into the stands. Strike one on Don. Johnson got a double his first time up in inning number one, grounded out in the third inning, and struck out his last time up in inning number six. Newhouser pitches low into the dirt on the inside. Ball one. One ball, one strike. And young Newhouser this year won 25 games against nine losses for Detroit. And last year he won 29 against nine losses. And he's bidding here this afternoon for his second World Series victory over the Detroit Tigers. Now he grips that ball. He's ready to go. The one-on-one -on -one pitch to Johnson is high. Ball two. Two balls, one strike. Don Johnson grips his bat, swings with a slow one, soft balance, and fouls it off. Two balls, two strikes. Now Hank Wise is warming up in the bullpen for Chicago. Newhouser taking more and more time with each passing pitch as the game goes on and on into its final stanzas. Pitch is low into the dirt. Ball three on Don Johnson. There's activity in the bullpen of the Tigers now, too. Benton and Overmeyer. Johnson swings on that one. It's foul on the ground outside of third base. Nine to two, the score stands. And every loyal Chicago fan glued to his seat here as we move into the last half of the eighth. Here's the three and two pitch to Johnson. He swings on it, slaps it down to shortstop. It's taken on the first bounce by Skeeter Webb. The throw to York in time. Johnson is out by two strides. 
Peter Webb's played a pretty snappy brand of baseball in this series. Been guilty of only one error, and he's had more than his fair share of chances there at shortstop. Now here's Peanuts Lowry, the former MP in the Army, steps up there batting right-handed. One for three today. The door between is high. Ball one. Lowry's had eight hits in the series out of 28 times up. Takes a call strike. That was a downer, and it had a lot of stuff on it. That's inside that pitch. Ball two, two balls, two strikes on Lowry. One out and nobody on in the last half of the eighth inning. Al Newhauser calmly working. Winds up, left hands it in. It's swung on, bloop down the left field line. In comes Greenberg. He can't come up to it. It falls in for a hit for Lowry. And Lowry is on at first. That's his second hit of the afternoon. Both of them get out there to Greenberg in left field. Now comes Cabaretta. That is the seventh hit off Newhauser. The 22nd hit off of him in the series. Bill Cabaretta, who's two for three this afternoon, steps up there. Dark complexion. Good looking, very quiet. Pitch to him is on the inside for ball one. Newhouser works, swung on by Cabaretta, and it's hit back on the ground into center field. Lowry is turning his way down to third, and Kramer fields the ball into second. Lowry is the third, Cabaretta at first. That was the third hit today for Cabaretta. Now here's Pafko, batting right-handed. He has a triple in three times up today. And the pressure is on Handy Andy. Swings on that one. It's a high foul coming back into the stand. Strike one on Pafko. And here's the kid from the farm country of Wisconsin. Two of his five brothers used to get up in the morning an hour ahead of time so they could get their farm chores done and go out and play some Pafko baseball. And here he is with his team behind at bat with a chance to strike a great blow for his team, the Chicago Cubs, here in the eighth inning of the deciding game of this 45 World Series. Swings on that one, hits it on the ground, foul, outside at third base. Score is 9-2 to at Detroit in front. These Cubs, they're not through yet. Newhauser carefully rubbing up a new ball. Two strikes quickly on Pat, though. He's fouled off two of them. The pitch is swung on. He strikes out. Newhouser struck out Papco twice in a row with men on bases. And for Newhouser, that is strikeout number eight. In the series, it's his 20th strikeout. That makes it two out now for Chicago in the last of the eight. And still Cabaretta's at first and Lowry at third. And here's Nicholson. Nicholson hasn't hit today. Hasn't gotten the ball out of the infield. Takes an outside pitch for ball one. Nicholson, who has batted in seven runs, more than anybody else in the series. There, batting left-handed, swings on one. There's a high, towering foul off to the right of the plate. Richards goes over to the stands, but it's going into the stands. That's a strike on Nicholson. One ball, one strike on Bad Bill. Nicholson, the big fella, from down in Chesterton, Maryland. Fellow who was a kid, wanted to go to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. But color blindness kept him out. So he went to Washington College instead, graduated, and here he is, a Major League Baseball star. One and one on him. That pitch is down a little bit low, into the dirt. I think he foul tipped it. Not sure. I'll tip put Richards on the hand, and Richards is trotting over toward the dugout of the Tigers, and there will be time called now. Yep, Nicholson foul tipped that one just slightly off of his bat, and it caught Richards on the hand, his right hand, and he promptly ran over toward the dugout, and I think that that will be all for Richards. I believe Bob Swift is being waved in from the bullpen. So Richards has apparently hurt a finger on his throwing hand. And just to keep Newhouse warm, here comes Jimmy Wilson, I think. Let's see who that is coming out to warm him up. Young Jimmy Miller, 
So it is coming out to keep Newhouser warm as Bob Swift gets the tools of catching on. He's coming in here as Richards is injured in the last half of the eighth inning. That's too bad for Paul. One ball, two strikes is the count on the batter, Nicholson. He's batting in the clutch for Chicago in the last half of the eighth as these Cubs try to stay in the running. Cabaret is at first, Lowry is at third. Now Steve O'Neill is walking out of the dugout of the Tigers and back to his spot, coaching behind third. And that'll be all in this series for Paul Richards. Richards has certainly done himself very handsomely in the series. Today he has driven in four runs, and this the seventh and deciding ball game for a total of six runs batted in in the series. He's had two doubles today, which gives him four hits out of 19 times up in the series. He was walked four times, and he struck out three times. That's a record of accomplishment on the part of Paul Richards that stamps him as a tremendous asset to the Tigers in this very, very thrilling 1945 series. And Steve O'Neill has stopped on his way back to third now to say a few words to his son-in-law, Skeeter Webb, who plays at shortstop. And now O'Neill seems to have inspected everything, and he's going back to the Tiger dugout. And here's Bob Swift. Swift, who was born in Salina, Kansas. He said he thought up until a couple of weeks ago that he was born in a place called Kip, Kansas. But he sort of talked it over with the family, and they tell him he was born in Salina. They lived for a while in Kip, which is a small town outside of Salina, Kansas. And Swift, as we've mentioned before, is known as the best waffle maker in Major League Baseball, as if that had any bearing on what's happening right now down there. It doesn't. Newhauser is pitching to Swift now, and Swift is taking his throw down to second. Now he grabs the mask, puts it on, and the sturdy fellow is ready to go. Now here's the situation. There are two out in the last of the eighth. Lowry is at third. Cabaret is at first. They both hit Newhauser. And the count on Bill Nicholson is one ball, two strikes. Now the left-handed slugger Nicholson is in there. Again, his jaw is stuck out at Newhauser. Newhauser pitches low and outside, ball two. Two balls, two strikes, two out, two on. Newhouser stretches. Nicholson swings on it, and it's foul on the ground down the first baseline. Count remains two balls, two strikes. Though Detroit has a lead of 9-2, to two, this game, like all baseball games, and that's the, one of the thrilling aspects of this great American pastime, is not over until the last man is out. Nobody is saying that to himself more sharply than Nicholson at the plate now. Swings on one, snaps it on to center field. It's good for a hit. It's going to the right of Kramer. Lowry has already scored. Caporetto is rounding third and holding up at third, and Nicholson is into second with a double. Caporetto was held up at third as that ball was retrieved and left center field by Doc Kramer and whipped in. Kramer has a pretty good throwing arm. So Nicholson is at second now. Caporetto is at third. One run is crossed. The score is 9-3, to three, and the batter is Mickey Livingston. That's the eighth run batted in in this series for Nicholson, and it ties him for a seven-game series record with Gil Scarson of Washington, who batted in eight runs in 24, and Al Simmons of the A's, who hit in eight runs in 1931. Of course, in a four-game series, Gehrig in 28 drove in nine. Now there's a swinging strike by Mickey Livingston, who missed it. Livingston batting right-handed is one for three today. He has driven in four runs in this series. He has eight hits out of 21 times up. The pitch is good for a call strike. Livingston started for it, checked his swing, and Art Passarella calls it a strike. So it's two strikes on Livingston. Runners at second and third for Chicago. Two out, last of the eight. The Cubs trying to rally. Newhouser pitches, high and inside. Ball one. One ball, two strikes. Livingston, a discharged GI, was in the Army ground forces. He's had his misfortunes in baseball. He's had his ups and downs, but he's a hard customer. Swing strikes out. So Newhauser whipped through his ninth strike out of the ball game to retire the side in the last half of the eighth inning. That brought one run for Chicago on three hits, two base runners left on, and there were no Detroit errors. So the score at the end of eight full innings of this thrilling seventh and deciding game of the 45 series is Detroit 9 and Chicago 3.
Boy, you can't afford to miss Bill Coram's highlights of today's thrilling ball game. So stay tuned in. Here a great reporter do his stuff right off the cuff just as soon as the last man is out in this game here at Wrigley Field. Now we see the team number nine. As the sands of time and fortune are running out, and the Charlie Graham, as you can see, is using the time ammunition he has in the Colorado squad. Try to pull this game out in here. This is the point. He's right there. He's coming in out there. As you know, I'll just be in my good night. I think we always started the ball game. And the question is, why? That's the last of him. 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 That's the last of It'll be York, Alcorn, Sweat, and Matt Sykes on this inning, Darrell Ann's ball of the night. Involved. And only 30 bikes are all out of there. Man, he's out there on the center field. Okay. Eyes works. Mark swings on it. There's a high hit. 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 But you don't get too much noise in the background of the Cub Rally on Jimmy Ossie. The fans are filling, filling, filling for that team. That's right. And Eddie Mayo having a batting left hand at three in this ball game. He's got five for 27 in the series. Erickson was very fast in the third ball, just above the knees on the outside. He's got it in three runs. Mayo has left handed. He's one for three in this game. He's been playing over Batchel White from inside. They need more running of the shed by ball one. And he's got a strike on these two. Mayo usually fights his chewing gum on that part of his cap. I haven't seen him run for the whole series. He's a little bit too serious. He's got a gum on your cap. He's a little bit too serious. He's got a little bit too serious. He's got a little bit too high. Ball two. Here's my world. That's changing gate pressure. Hired on the left. I'll be taking a look at the mail through his glasses. He's got a little bit too serious. He's got a little bit too serious. He's around 190 pounds. 29 years old. That was a pretty deep hit ball. Oh, and the pass around where he's starting with the crack of the line, was running back into his left. Seven game series. Now Hank got it almost for that line coming wall out there. He made the catch. Swing was up as a rounding ball. Hank made the catch. Now he gets the ball down into a pass around Hank. And that was Lippin's out. And he's done for Kramer. Five up three. Done 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 three. Done
Can you get down with them?
Runner now is Norwich and right-handed hitter. Reza Double out of three times up. He has driven in three runs this afternoon and five in the series. I had a wire from down in Atlanta where he used to be the manager of the Crackers, and they said down there we actually call him Old Slug. And the old Slug swings, and this is one. That's a strike on ball. And Hughes, the short shot, one time run. Couldn't get out. On call. The first run comes in, and that's hit number three off the road. And then that's it. And that's it. For right hand at the end. Richard Stokes is off the swing. He pops it off, falls to the ground. And now he's up again. And he was sort of trying to move himself out of the way of that pitch. His bat came swinging around, and the ball caromed off his bat. He ended up on the ground. Strike three. Down low into the dirt. He can bat and be looking stuck. The third is going to be coming in too. Batter coming up now is Hal Newhouse. Steve O'Neill, coaching down at third. He's looking down at the ground, kicking the dirt a little bit. I imagine at this particular point, his heart is full of joy and nervousness. To Richard, he springs on, slaps out center field. It's falling in for a hit. It's falling to the left of Pat Law. It's rolling to the wall out there. Here's Columbine rounding third. He's headed to the plate. Here comes the throw into second. And Richard Swayze holds up a second for a run producing double. That's the second double of the afternoon for Old Slug, Paul Richards. And it's a sport run by the end of the day. And for Detroit, they run number seven. Yeah. And they lead the Cubs now by a score of seven to two. Yeah. 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 A round of applause for Newhouser if he comes up. Yeah. That's left-handed. Erickson touches him inside. Ball one. Paul Richards takes a lazy lead off second there. Outside. He's lazy. Not lazy. That's that. He's just relaxed. Newhouser swings on one. Slaps it out towards center field. Capo going to his right. Takes it nicely on the run. Right there right now. Back to the shore of the red That's all for Detroit in the top of the center. One run on one hit. There was one base runner left on. There were no common errors. And the score at the end of six and a half innings of play is Detroit seven and Chicago two. Well, now, just about everybody knows genial Irish Joe Fowler from the Boston Red Sox, one of the greatest shortstops of all time. Joe, who has spent more years as a player manager than any other major leaguer, is with us here in the booth again this afternoon. Play him playing short when you were on the air last Saturday, Joe. So let's pick up where we left off. You know, we say that's that you like Razor and Gillette Blue Blade are the greatest shaving team on earth. Uh, what do you think? I'm with you 100% on that, Bill. In my experience, no other combination compares with it for easy shaving. Right you are, Joe. That's because the Gillette Razor and Gillette Blue Blade are made for each other and work together perfectly. Well, they sure do a swoop. They do a job with my whiskers every time. Well, that's the thing that's very straight and thanks to your father. Remember, man, that's sharp A-sharp, B-sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blade with the sharpest edges ever home. Despite the fact that it's now it's the home half of the seventh inning, and still the Chicago fans are on their feet in the old baseball custom. It's going to be the first time for Chicago in the last of the seventh. Left to Hell Newhouse. And this series is 1 1 and lost 1. And is trying to pitch the Tigers into the World's Championship in 1945. He's doing pretty handsomely right now. He's on the mound. And this young 24 year old who's a Detroit product on the way started his athletic career in River Wright High School at Bad. One of the great stars. Tiger history this year is about to pitch to Nicholson. He does so, and Nicholson takes it. It's outside. All one. Well, Nicholson has a good today. Fouled out once to the catcher, and the next time hit back to Newhouse on the mound. Swings on this one. There's a high foul up coming back into the snag. Lands on the screen and lazily rolls out. One ball, one strike. And big Bill Nicholson. No hits. It's a one ball game. Nicholson has driven in seven runs so far in this series. As well as anybody else. There's a line to the line of the delivery. That's a good strike. Spun all the way around. Newhauser lets it go. It's high, and Nicholson fouls it off. Reaching for a high three quarter speed curveball. First cut out of the One ball, two strikes. Al Newhauser working very well for Detroit. Delivery is very weak. Nicholson is dark on the touch, and he has that menacing attitude of the light that we've described for you so many times. I pass around the plate on the fire. On Rudy Orr. He goes out there and holds second hole of the game for a second while some Tiger players in the ballpen down right field get off the field. 
He was struck out a lot of ways. Now he's ready to go. And here's the pitch. Nicholson swings on it. There's a bounding ball. There's a pitch. The yard has it. Toss to the underhand to Newhouse. He's got a solid pitch just ahead of Nicholson for the out. He looked like the Darren Jackson is out three to one. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see the glass. Another rather smooth way out to see Strikes 
And there's a high curve right now. Now he has three strikes on him. Call third strike. He's the only uh, that was a very, very clever curveball by Hill Hauser. And now, on the arm of his head, and he got Sakari, who was standing waiting. That's a matter of his neck. Smiling Stanley Campfield has the California, who's been one of the stars in the series. That's left-handed. Because he's one time up today, and he hasn't been today. And they have the run so far. The pitch is close to him and inside. Yeah, and regardless of how this series comes out, there's a great figure in baseball at that plate down there. It's Dan Hack. Now on that round is a great young left-handed pitcher. We should have a magnificent round of the 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 the left handed batter. The count on Richards now is one and one. one now one Mayo right. tries to sneak behind Livingston at second. The crowd warns him. Here on the left. Uh, on that, but he goes down, down, down at third. He steps on third, crossing Livingston, and retiring the side. Gets in the air, goes out. Left field foul line. Now Scott Livingston now at third to the first round of baseman. That's a fast one. And he's got no runs for Chicago. One hit, two base runners left on. There were no Detroit errors. At the end of seven fillings of play, the score is Detroit seven, Chicago two. Now when this crucial game ends this afternoon, Stay tuned in for Bill Corham, the famous columnist of the New York Journal of American Sports Stats. Here are Bill's reporter highlighting today's baseball classic. Now we're waiting for the start of operations in the top of swing number eight. Uh, let's take a little pause here, ten seconds, for station identification. Remember, man, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use joint blue blades with the sharpest edges ever home. This is the mutual broadcasting system. This is one of the new in Chicago, a servant of the world. Now at the end of inning number seven, Al has our total scores here. Detroit, seven runs, eight hits, one error. Chicago, two runs, six hits, and no errors. And now coming into pitch for Chicago in the top of the eighth inning is Claude Passau. Passau's been, as you know, one of the great figures in this series. Pitching up in Detroit, and one of the most crazy games ever heard in the World Series. Passau, appearing in his third game, has pitched 15 and two-thirds innings. He's given up six hits. He has struck out three, and he has walked seven. And he has credited with one victory and no defeats in this series. And he failed to come through down here. I was out, and the Cubs went ahead and won the ball game, so he was not credited with a defeat, or debited, rather, with a defeat. Count of one and one on. First battery faces is Jimmy Webb, the right-handed team shortstop in Detroit. That's a pitches to him with Lowen inside. And Claude is working out there with a badly split fingernail on his left hand when he flagged down a uh, hot line drive the other day. Which is characteristic of Passo. Coming back into the stand. Now down in the fourth end for Chicago is Brooklyn's Bob Chipman. First base One and one is the count that the sturdy round left armor from Mississippi Passo has on the bag. I was down to two and one because one pitch like that was not so high. So all two. Three and a half innings of three. The score stands Tiger six. Well, it got up to that inning now in the first inning. is not. Well, I like the record. Short wind up. Yes. Once you're taking you and it's high. Three and four hits. Three and one. Speed counts for plenty and children too. But it's going to cost the Cubs now to try to get these Tigers out of here just as rapidly as you need to. Then come back in the two innings of the regulation lengths of the Cubs in Chicago. You can go about this five runs. That's more. It's a bell. So that is walk. When you shave, brush my shoulders. Just try. Second walk. Here's what I've got in this series. I'm going to hit you. 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 I'm going to h
Now the Hatcher is in the mail. Uh, very bad. Mayor has one hit out of four times up today. Three to four times going for 27 in the street. Just brush the snow. The fundus moisture and stay wet on you. Now for the last half of inning number four. Eddie, the biggest black leg right hand inside pitches. One pitches. Never not a hurry. Fellows coming up for him. Working together at bat. They give you the stunt game. Games of your life. As for the local, you like to watch the local line. They're taking up the time. They can see all the things here all the time. held on at first by Cabaretta. He was shot. 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 That was works again. Right center field. 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 And who's double once he's seven he's coming up now. Standard delivers. Mayo, he's he's got got ahead of the first time. Right, right field. field. Doc Kramer swings on that one. Got on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Don Johnson, Johnson the second shot. Oh, wow. it up he's first, first in time. Max had 11 hits for Johnny. Other players have the ball game. Out of the way from me. Reached second in the air with his right hand. Plucked it out of the air. Threw it to first. You got Kramer. Mayo going to third on the play. Third base. Third base. One out. Cabaretta. Record. Bronx. Runner at third. Four. Eight to two in favor of Detroit. And this year. Eight to two. Eight to two. Come to the plate. Doc Kramer. Picks it up. First man. Newhouse. Base. Third base. Out here. Big hang. Second baseman. That strike out of the one. But it's hard to hit. It's harder. Greenberg has dropped twice. Second base. One. 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 This is the time of the in the game. That's all I want. Two to two. Pitch up close to him. And a little bit high. All one. Takes a look at the first pitch. And it's a high curve. And they try to start his here. And their numbers are not pleasing. Back in the first inning. Are shouting for Hank to get a hit. They like the same slug that long ball. Doc Lemmer goes back into his leg. Always walking around by the mound, kicking some dirt out of the way. Here comes the ball. 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 Larry came in, made a running catch on that line drive. Greenberg's out of the left field, retiring Greenberg, but Mayo, with speedy on his feet, came in to score run number nine for Detroit. That makes it two runs. Nobody on, two runs in here at the top of the eighth, and he got one of those by. Combine with a walk eight times in this series, kept up there, and falls off the first pitch from pass off. Like what? For strike one. So the road becomes steeper for the Cubs. Johnson with his double. Passo delivers a little high. Cullen Bynes taking it. Ball one. Run number two one ball, one strike. Now a six to two ball game. Al delivers. Cullen Bynes has struck out and scrolled three times in this game. Another pitch to him is high again. Ball two. Good. That's a call out of right now. up and out the second. Big Roy, who got off for a slow start in the series, come through on fast fashion. He has five hits out of 21 times up. Swing down up and there's a towering high infield pop up back on his last under just Johnson now at second and he takes it for the out. There's one out for Chicago here in the front. At the time he's trying to be quite in the top of the eighth inning. Two runs. On one hit, there are no base runners left on, and there are no Chicago Bears. So at the end of seven and a half minutes of play, the score is Detroit 9, Chicago 2. Well, it was Joe Clinton, famous for his African way and his ready smile, who said earlier today that in his experience, no other shaving combination compares with the Gillette Razor and Gillette Blue Ray. Now, I might add that in the Army and in the Navy, on land, on sea, and in the air, it's the Gillette Razor and Gillette Blue Blade by overwhelming odds. That's what we say. And the Gillette Blue Blade and the Gillette Razor are made for each other. In the same factory, by the same skill test, to the same high precision standard. Yes, today's Gillette Blue Blade and your Gillette Razor are the perfectly matched shaving combination. They fit exactly, work together beautifully, and turn in the smoothest performance known in shape. Remember, Nick Sharp. Field shot, field shot. 
used to lead blue blade with the sharpest edges ever held. Now the hand has the eighth inning. And again, Hal Newhouse will be trying to the right field. And again, young Prince Hal. Back to the You work that left arm of his. Throws it over to first. And he has been the fight to fight as he goes in the third to a ball ring start and losing that first game at Detroit. So he has won the whole series after the season. The main pitching hole for the Detroit Tigers. Five to one in favor. And Newhouse are out there today. And there's a big man left in the ball. Now Newhouse. Now facing John Johnson. First one is that's what a knockout strike out of the ball game in favor of the young Newhouse. This year, 125 games against nine last year. Last year, 129 against nine last year. And Jimmy this afternoon for his second World Series of the game. He's going to be Rudy Orr. Now, he's going to be Rudy Orr. Now, he's going to be Rudy Orr. Now, he's going to be Rudy Orr. So you have to try by a team. Sucker for you have to have one strike. One sort, no hits in one try. Bath throws hit the ball away from the dead. He's had five hits. Pitching for the Chicago. And Johnson sets it back. Swings in the small one. He's ready to throw. Half balance and fouls it off. Bath throws swings. Lost to strike. Pitching for the ball. Short right hand hitter. Right back to Mayo. One out to throw on. Now Hank Lyle is lining up in the bill time for Chicago. First pitch for the same. Here it's out. Andy Kraft will hit one down to Skeeter Webb at short. He played it very well. He's taking a long, long time with each of these guys. He's got a chap right coming down. That is the game. Goes on and on to its final stand. Watch it go into the dirt. All three on Don Johnson. Watch it go into the dirt. All three on Don Johnson. Watch it go into the dirt. First inning. One run on two hits. Looks down at O'Neill behind third. These balls are handled carefully. Watch the manager. And there was one resort activity in the ball. Watch it go into the dirt. Play the score stand. Stand up and move on. Now he's going to go back to the top. On the ground, outside the third base. Right here. One ball, two strikes. Chicago. Paul Derringer. Nine to two, the score is high. Moves up. And every loyal Chicago fan still do see here. We're moving to the last half of the eighth. And then again to pitch to Johnson. He swings on and slaps it down. He should have stopped a stake on the first bounce by Skeeter Webb. The throw to York in time. Look sharp. Better come in. Feel sharp. Feel sharp. You he walked through the race. played a pretty snappy land in baseball in this series. And he's guilty of only one error, and he's had more than his first year of ten of that short shot. Now here's Peanuts Lowry. Vandenberg, former MP in the Army. Steps up there batting right-handed. One for three today. Strike one. The delivery time is high. Ball one. Outfield immediately when the outlaw gets up there. Lowry's had eight hits in the series out of 28 times up. Takes and the ball strike. One away in the fifth. Delivered it down there. Had a lot of stuff on it. Swing at that one, but pulled up in time to take it low. The ball one. One ball and one strike. It's a count on third baseman Jimmy Houston. Inside that pitch. Ball two. Two balls, two strikes on Lowry. Vandenberg. One out and nobody on in the last half of the eighth inning. It swung on and hit just over the outstretched fingertips of Hughes. Not into left field for a base hit. Al Newhauser calmly working. Singles right Lines up, stop. left hands it in. Left. It's swung on, Bloop down the left field line. In comes Greenberg. He can't come up to it. It falls in for a hit for Lowry. And Lowry is on at first. That's his second hit of the afternoon. That number is out there to Greenberg in left field. Now comes Cabaretta. That is the sudden hit off Newhauser. He turns around and really The 20 second hit off of him in the series. Bill Cabaretta, who's two for three this afternoon, steps up there. Dark complexion, good looking, very quiet. Which swings on the inside for ball one. They're flying spikes off outlaws, flies under the peg, and he's safe at second. So he'll get credit for the first Swung on by Cabaretta, and it's hit back on the ground into center field. Lowry is turning his way down to third, and Kramer fields the ball into second. Lowry is the third, Cabaretta at first. That was the third hit today for Cabaretta. Now oh, here's Pat Cole, batting right-handed. He has a triple and three times up today. And the pressure is on Handy Andy. Swings on that one, it's a high foul coming back into the stand. Strike one on Pat Cole. 
And here's the kid from the farm country of Wisconsin. Two of these five brothers used to get up in the morning an hour ahead of time so they could get their farm chores done and go out and play some half throw baseball. And here he is with his team behind at bat with a chance to strike a great blow for his team, the Chicago Bucks, here in the eighth inning of the deciding game of this 45 World Series. Swings on that one, hits it on the ground foul outside at third base. The score is behind the two at Detroit in front. These Cubs, they're not through yet. Newhauser comfortably rubbing up a new ball. Two strikes quickly on Pat, though. He's fouled off two of them. The pitch is swung on. He strikes out. Newhouse has struck out Papco twice in a row with men on bases. And for Newhouse, that is strikeout number eight. In the series, it's his 20th strikeout. That makes it two out now for Chicago in the last of the eighth. And still, Cabaret is at first and Lowry at third. And here's Nicholson. Nicholson hasn't hit today. Hasn't gotten the ball out of the infield. Takes an outside pitch for ball one. Nicholson, who has batted in seven runs more than anybody else in the series. They're batting left-handed, swings on one, there's a high, towering foul off to the right of the plate. Richards goes over to the stands, but it's going into the stands. That's a strike on Nicholson. One ball, one strike on Bad Bear. Nicholson, the big fellow, down in Chesterton, Maryland. Fellow who was a kid, wanted to go to the United States Naval Academy at Annapolis. But colorblindness kept him out. So he went to Washington College instead, graduated, and here he is a Major League Baseball star. One and one on him. He swings on the first one. That pitch is down a little bit low into the dirt. I think he foul tipped it. Not sure. Foul tipped it. Richards on the hand, and Richards is trotting over toward the dugout of the Tigers, and there will be time called now. Nicholson yep. foul tipped that one just slightly off his bat. And it caught Richards on the hand, his right hand, and he promptly ran over toward the dugout. And I think that that will be all for Richards. I believe Bob Swift is being waved in from the bullpen. Richards has apparently hurt a finger on his throwing hand. Just to keep you how to warm, here comes Jimmy Wilson, I think. See who that is coming out to warm him up. Among them is the thrill we young Jimmy Miller. The good things we've so it is coming out to keep new house warm as Bob Swift gets the tools of catching on. He's coming in here as Richards is injured in the last half of the eighth inning. That's too bad. Now most stores have left tech stock right now. And you'll cut to find one more you trade. So one ball, two strikes, and down on the batter, Nicholson. He's batting in the clutch for Chicago in the last half of the eighth as these Cubs try to stay in the running. Cabaretta's is the first, Lowry is the third. Now Steve O'Neill is walking out of the dugout of the Tigers and back to his spot, approaching behind third. And that'll be all in this series for Paul Richards. Richards has certainly done himself very handsomely in the series. Today he has driven in four runs, and this is the seventh and deciding ball game for a total of six runs batted in in the series. He's had two doubles today, which gives him four hits out of 19 times up in the series. He was walked four times, and he struck out three times. That's a record of accomplishment on the part of Paul Richards that stamps him as a tremendous asset to the Tigers in this very, very thrilling 1945 series. And Steve O'Neill has stopped on his way back to third now to say a few words to his son-in-law, Skeeter Webb, who plays at shortstop. Jolly Charlie Grimm, with his team trailing by four runs, is cutting up capers galore now in the O's. He's going back to the target line. He swings and now that's it. Strike one. One ball was drawn in Salina, Kansas. He said he thought about the way all the game was more in a place called Tip Kansas. But he seemed to try to go out and try and now they were going in Salina. The best of the good for a while, looking mighty keen, which is a small town outside of Salina. And these Cubs are fighting back. You know how it as we've mentioned. It's good. Walking inside the corner. And here's the same part of the play. He walks away from the fight. And Charlie Grimm comes walking in from third. And he's now out here. Now Swift is taking his... He's going out of the Now he grabs the outside corner. And now he's going to have got themselves a bit of a run to lay on down there. He was sticking his chin out at Passarella. That's why right. here's the situation. Right. There are two out in the last eight. Military police in the army. Cabaret is at first. They both hit Newhausen. Now he's going to start up again. One ball, two strike. Now he's going to start up again. 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 Now he's going to start up again.
Good yeah, ball, ready to go. Ball inside, ball two. Here's it's inside. Ball two. Ball two, ball two, ball two, ball two, ball two, ball two on. And a derisive draw from the crowd. Who disagreed with the call on that last one. New one two now, Roy Hughes. Nicholson swings on it and it's foul on the ground down the first base line. Here it is. Down to main two ball. Ball strike right. three. And Hughes is sore again. But he's out of there. Well, he tries second lead. I'm not going to stuck out in this ball game. It's a high ball game. Three. That's the, one of the thrilling aspects of the great American last year. Is not all the other things that are coming up. Nobody is saying that to him. Place a wide hand in there. It's heavy power. Swings on right, drops it out to center field. It's going to the right hand. It's going to the right of Kramer. Lowry has already scored. Time at the red is rounding. Third and Nicholson in the second round. 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 Caparetta was held up third as that ball was retrieved. Now Caparetta is still back out to Kramer and Hurricane. Kramer has a pretty good throwing arm. The crowd is moving up in now. Caparetta is at third. One run is called to score as high as three, and the batter is Mickey Livingston. That's pitch is high for ball two. That's the eighth run by the Denver series for Nicholson, and it ties him for a seven-game series record with Gus Dawson of Washington, who batted in eight runs in 24. Now, the A's will lead eight runs in 1931. Time on every pitch in a four-game series. Gary in number 28. Now there's a swing strike when Emily Livingston is batting in here behind the catcher. Livingston batting right hand. Two strikes. One for three today. He has driven in four runs in the series. I saw or eight hits, I believe. 21 times. It does seem to be working out down there in the middle. for a call strike. Livingston started for it. Checked his swing. And Art Passarella calls it a strike. Now a new ball put in play. Newhouser has it rubbed up. So it's two strikes on Livingston. Runners in second and third. It's a little too high. Makes it ball three. Three out on the car. Trying to rally. Newhouse pitches. Two strikes. 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 Now the leadoff hitter, Stanley Hunter, what's the only thing to the ball game to retire the side in the last half of the eighth inning? Stanley has been turned back at the bottom of his run in Chicago on three hits, two big runners left on, there were no Detroit errors. So the score at the end of eight full innings of this spring seventh all signing game of the 45 series seems to be getting shorter and shorter as this game wears on. Chicago, three. Boy, you can't afford to miss Bill Coram's highlights. Here comes the swing ball game. Ground ball to show. Stay tuned in. Scoops it out of the yeah, ground. Great report. Just stunned down the cup. Just as soon as the last hand is on this game here at Wrigley Field. So in the last the fifth inning, there's nothing across for the Chicago Cubs. And the score at the end of five full innings of play is Detroit six and Chicago two. And I believe it's Big Ron Paul Erickson who's coming in to be the next pitcher for the Cubs. The wait till he's officially announced. He's taking the stride in, though, from out there in left field where the bullpen is located. And while Erickson is coming to the mound to complete his warm-up pitches and to appear as the fourth pitcher this afternoon for the Chicago Cubs, uh, let's pause here ten seconds for station identification. Remember, men, look sharp, feel sharp, be sharp. Use Gillette Blue Blades with the sharpest edges ever honed. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. This is WGN Chicago serving the West. 